Almighty God, we, the representatives of the citizens of the City of Brisbane, are assembled here to strive and care for the welfare of our city and all of its people. Lord, we ask you to guide us in our decisions we make today. Amen. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet and pay our respect to elders past and present. Please be seated. I declare, I declare the meeting open and remind all councillors of their obligations to declare material personal interest and conflict of interest where relevant and the requirement of such to remove yourself from the council chamber for debate and voting where applicable. Are there any apologies? No apologies or no one rising for apologies. Confirmation of minutes, please. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the minutes of the 4,592nd meeting held on Tuesday the 4th of June 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that the minutes of the 4,592nd meeting of Council held on the 4th of June 2019 be received, taken as read and confirmed. Those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. There is no public participant today, and so we we'll begin question time. Are there any questions of the Lord Mayor or Chair of any of the Standing Committees? Councillor Mackay. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, this administration is committed to cutting the cost of living for seniors in Brisbane. Can you outline what tomorrow's budget will mean for them in terms of public transport and getting them home quicker and safer? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Mackay, for the question. And, um, uh, councillors would be well aware that uh, I have risen many, many times in this chamber to talk about the cost of public transport fares, a cost that is set by the state government, a cost uh, where the revenue goes to the state government, and something that we don't directly control, but something I believe does impact on patronage. Now, we have been entirely consistent and clear uh, with our position on fares, and that is that they should be cheaper to encourage more public transport use. Uh, on the other hand, those opposite, they can't seem to decide whether fares should be cheaper um, or whether they should stand up for their state government colleagues. Because whenever we talk about fares, they say, oh, no, there's other factors involved. Fares were, fares were reduced back in 2016. There's no problem, nothing to see here. Uh, yet, um, sometimes they come out with their own ideas about fares, like free ferries or Fair Free Friday, for example, wasn't that a great one? Uh, but, Madam Chair, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this uh, particular initiative is consistent with our approach. It is consistent with LNP policy, uh, and it is consistent with the policy the state LNP team went to the last state election with, which is free travel for seniors during off-peak times. Uh, why have we put this forward? Number one, we want to boost patronage. We are currently running buses ferries and city cats around, whether it's peak or off-peak, uh, those services are being provided. Whether they, whether they are full or whether they are not full, those services are being provided. We'd like to see them being used. We'd like to see use of existing capacity, and we know that during those off-peak times there is plenty of capacity for more people to jump on board public transport. But we also know uh, that for our seniors, social isolation is a big problem. It's a big issue out there in the community. Now, we don't want to get our seniors home quicker and safer. We want to get them out quicker That's and safer. We want to get them out and about quicker and safer and at no cost. And this is a big part of what we're pushing for here as part of this policy. Uh, this initiative, which we want to start in October as soon as possible, uh, will involve us paying around $3 million to the state government to reimburse them for their lost fare revenue. Now, uh, this is something that we believe will be important to get more people on public transport, to support our seniors. And it is something, Mr Chair, that you know came from community feedback. Uh, we were just up in your ward uh, a few months ago talking to your seniors in your transport forum you organised about what they'd like to see happen. And there was a lot of great feedback and initiatives that came out of that. This was one of those suggestions put forward by the community. And so we know that people are asking for this to happen. We know that our seniors want to get out, uh, out and about at no cost on our public transport to enjoy the things this great city has to offer. Uh, this should be a city for all. And that means that if you uh, are um, living by yourself or if you're getting on in age, you shouldn't be locked out of the benefits of this great city. 
Uh, you should be able to participate. You should be able to get out and about. And particularly for those seniors on very low incomes or on pensions, I know this will make a difference. Uh, my parents are pensioners themselves. Uh, they do use the public transport to get out and about. Uh, and I know uh, that they uh, this is something that they will take advantage of and benefit from, just like all seniors and pensioners will, uh, the people who are eligible for the Seniors Go Card. So this is an exciting initiative, not only about public transport, but also about social inclusivity, about making sure that people have the opportunity to enjoy the great uh, lifestyle opportunities that Brisbane has. But also, we know that our seniors do an incredible amount of work for community organisations. They get out there, they support their local community groups, uh, and, and this will help them uh, in that cause as well. There are thousands or tens of thousands of hours done by our seniors on a voluntary basis for organisations across the city, uh, and this particular initiative will help in that respect as well. So there are many benefits to this uh, initiative. Uh, I can't wait for it to get up and running in October. Uh, and once again, I wanted to call on the state government to make sure that they allow us to have a speedy implementation of this initiative. It would be great to get it up and running before the 1st of October. Uh, and we will certainly do that. We can, we can get it up and running as quickly as TransLink signs off on it. So uh, I put that uh, out there to the state government. We will get it up and running sooner if they approve it sooner. Uh, all they have to do is take our money. Uh, all they Mayor, have to do is Lord take Mayor, that $3 million. Are there any further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, my question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, can you, can you today confirm that not one cent of the $1 million allocated to the Victoria Park announcement will be spent on any advertising with your face on it in the lead up to the election? Lord Mayor. I'll make that confirmation if you confirm not one cent of ratepayers' money will go to newsletters in your ward with your face on them. Because it, it seems to be OK for Labor councillors to send out newsletters with seven photos of themselves on using ratepayers' money. Oh, but you know what? Not OK for the Lord Mayor to communicate with the residents of Brisbane. Not OK. That is another case of double standards here. Okay. This is Point a purely order. political question. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Sorry, I'm having trouble hearing the Lord Mayor. I agree. <laughs> Councillors, we're going to get a little bit rowdy there. Please allow the Lord Mayor to answer the question in silence. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, it, it just beggars belief that Labor keeps pushing this ludicrous suggestion oh. that it's OK for them to do it, but not OK on this side of the chamber. OK, so the, the Lord Mayor of Brisbane, whoever it might be, has an electorate of 1.1 million people or over 700,000 uh, enrolled voters. There is a responsibility of office to communicate with those people and, in fact, to let those people know how we are investing their ratepayer dollars, to let them know the projects that are coming, to let them know what we're doing to, grow, uh, our, to build our infrastructure, to grow our parkland, to invest in our new green space like Victoria Park. Uh, and it is OK for them to send out newsletters with seven photographs of themselves on, but it is not OK for the Lord Mayor. So th these double standards beggar belief. Uh, the reality is uh, we will be consulting with the community on Victoria Park because this is an exciting parkland initiative that people want to know about, that people want to get involved in. And, and what I'm interested in is what is what uh, the Labor Party's position on this is. Um, because when we're talking about golf courses, we know um, that there are many types of golfers, uh, but there's also a type of golfer called a Sunday hacker. And um, the announcement on Sunday brought out the Sunday hackers. Uh, first to tee up was Councillor Cook. Councillor Cook wanted to claim credit for this particular announcement. She teed off and said, this was Labor's idea. Uh, unfortunately, um, she rushed Point it. Point of order, Mr Point Chair. Order, Could you bring the Lord Mayor back to the question? <laughs> uh, carry on, Lord Mayor. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Chair. She rushed it and she ended up in the bunker. And so uh, second to tee Point off order. was Councillor Lord Cassidy. Councillor Cassidy. Uh, this, is, this is fun, Mr Chair, of course, but on relevant... 
No, I won't sit down. This is a point of order, Councillor Murphy. Uh, on relevance, Mr Chair, this was about advertising spend, not what Councillor Cook or what uh, I have said. The question was about the exposure of councillors in regards to Victoria Park. That's right. Exactly. Uh, the fund police point of order, Mr. Chair. strike again. Do you, would you like the Leader of the Opposition to, to read the question again? Because the question was very clearly about advertising money, Mr Chair. He asked about photographs. He asked about the image of councillors. Okay, so we're talking about the consultation process with residents on Victoria Park, and that was the question. Yeah, am I the only one to hear that? The fun, the fun police are out again. They want to ban something else. They want to ban the Lord Mayor's photograph. Um, they like to ban everything, smoking. Um, uh, Mr Chairman, um, so uh, Councillor Cook ended up in the bunker, so Councillor Cassidy teed up, uh, and guess what he wanted? A feasibility study. A feasibility. When has anyone in history needed a feasibility study to create a park? Yes. Parks are feasible. I can tell you parks are feasible. Why? We've got 2,000 of them out there. Do people want more or less parks? They want more. It's feasible. No study required, Councillor Cassidy. Uh, when you're asking for a feasibility study into a park, you know that you've been put up to do media and you have nothing con to contribute at all. Uh, they may have a new media advisor. Unfortunately, they're getting bad advice in this case because uh, there is nothing uh, anywhere in the world that would suggest we need a feasibility study to create a new park. I can tell you, the people of Brisbane believe it's feasible. The people of Brisbane want more green space and parkland. We don't need a feasibility study to tell us. You know why we would need a feasibility study? Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Shree. You've allowed the mayor a lot of leeway, but on relevance, this is a long way from the question that was asked now. I think that we've discussed relevance and, and I think the Lord Mayor is on topic. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. So uh, no feasibility study for a parkland on this side, you can be assured. We're going to get on and communicate with the people of Brisbane, consult with them and talk about the types Point of facilities order. they would want there. A point of order, Councillor Cumming. Mr Chairman, the Lord Mayor was asked, is any of this money going to be used, spent on advertising with his face on it in the lead up to the election? He has not answered that question. I believe he has answered that question. I've made it pretty clear. Uh, there will be no photographs of me if there are no photographs of you on your newsletters. As simple as that. Simple as that. So, you know, the power is in your hands, uh, Councillor Cumming. And if you're quite happy to take your photos off any material that you produce using ratepayer dollars, then we'll do the same thing. We'll do the same thing. Ten and a half million photos. Ten and a half million photos. Uh, well, I, 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 don't, I don't ever remember sending out a newsletter with seven photographs of myself on it, Councillor Cassidy. I don't ever remember doing that. But the reality is, this is a purely party political question. This is a purely party political question because they're not interested in new parkland. They're not interested Lord in Mayor, consulting with expired. people. They're interested in party Lord politics. Mayor, time's expired. Further questions, Councillor. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cumming. I move the suspension of standing orders to move to allow the following urgency motion to be moved. I move the council sanctions the Lord Mayor from allocating any funds from the Victoria Park announcement to be spent on advertising, including his face. Seconded. Um, you have three minutes. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, this uh, LNP administration has got an appalling track record at spending funds on projects to boost the Lord Mayor recognition factor. Right. The, uh, there's a recent example, of course, of the Metro, another Metro document put out Councilor, recently Councilor with Cumming, uh, Councillor Schrinner's face on it that, just that uh, added precisely... Just remind you, Councillor Cumming, just to keep it why it is urgent today. Yes. It's it precisely uh, added. The Metro document added precisely naught to the uh, knowledge of the of the uh, people of Brisbane of the Metro project. But it was a good opportunity that for this administration to get uh, the new Lord Mayor's face on a document, Madam, uh, Mr. Chairman. 
Madam, Mr Chairman, uh, it's, it, it's essential that this uh, resolution be passed today because the council needs to make it clear that this sort of behaviour from this administration, from this Lord Mayor, is inappropriate. They've spent millions of dollars on brochures and produced millions of dollars uh, of uh, uh, documents that have been put in letterboxes up and down the length and breadth of uh, Brisbane. We estimate last uh, year, last calendar year, some 15 to 20 documents were put in every letterbox in the city with a, a photo of the Lord Mayor. It doesn't happen at, at state level, it doesn't happen at federal level, and uh, they've got rules to stop it happening, but it does happen all the time in Brisbane. It's a disgrace. And uh, th this uh, this is being, will continue to be done right up to the election to, uh, to add, add to the Lord Mayor's profile. And uh, it's, it's about getting the Lord Mayor elected. It's not about consulting with the public. They don't need his face on the document to consult with the public. Uh, it's, it's urgent that the Lord Mayor make it crystal clear that the, uh, sorry, the council make it crystal clear the money will not be located, not, not be wasted on this, uh, this type of expenditure, and uh, we would ask that the uh, council support this resolution. Um, Councillor Cumming, do you have that in writing for distribution? All right. All right. All those in favour of the, result of the proposal, of the urgency motion, say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The noes have it. Vision. Vision called, Councillor. Coming in, Councillor Cassidy. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the noes have it, the voting being five in favour, 19 against and one abstention. Thank you, the noes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillor Huang, I believe you're asking a question. Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question is to the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Cooper, the Prince Charles Hospital in Chemside is undergoing expansion by the state government, meaning an increase in traffic and more pressure on parking in the area. Can you please give us an update on the ongoing talks with stakeholders and any progress that has been made? Councillor Cooper. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair, and I very much thank Councillor Huang for the question. Uh, I know that he is very interested in this particular uh, matter, as is, of course, Councillor Hammond, who uh, regularly sort of uh, asks me for updates. This chamber would be well aware that the Prince Charles Hospital is one of our state's premier cardiac hospitals. It employs over 3,000 people who provide medical assistance for over 420,000 people a year, so very much uh, important to us on the north side. The site also includes what was formerly known as the Holy Spirit Northside, a private hospital, which has now been renamed the St Vincent's Hospital, uh, and it is basically serv serving the community as is the public facility. In August of 2000, the state government then removed the hospital from council's planning. So it was then designated as community infrastructure and since then has got grown into a substantial medical precinct. So it is exempt from any consideration by council in terms of what is proposed on that site. 
Since 2007, we've seen the major upgrade of the hospital. So the general medical and surgical services have been added, including general adult medical uh, emergency services. The whole precinct has particularly grown very much since then with a lot more staff, a lot more patients, uh, and certainly the local community on a regular basis report that they are uh, having challenges as they try to access their local community uh, and seeing particularly parking in the local streets becoming an issue with staff choosing to park in the streets for free um, rather than utilise those um, sites on the hospital premises. So in February this year, I met with Minister Lynham, uh, the state member, to discuss the ongoing expansion of the Prince Charles Hospital, including two new proposed car parks, which will require access to and from Council's road network. As I highlighted to Council Lynham, um, we are very keen to work with all of the stakeholders to improve safety to the Prince Charles Hospital precinct. In line with our commitment, uh, we will be undertaking the fast tracking of a preliminary design uh, to cost up uh, signalising lights on Hamilton Road, possibly at Stabe Road, at our cost. So we'll be undertaking that design work, and that is currently underway and is due at the end of this calendar year. We've also committed, because that was a concern of the state government, that we will be entirely responsible for any future maintenance and operation of those lights. And we're also working with the hospital, as this chamber knows, to deliver the first ever Move Safe plan. At that meeting, the minister advised me that a master plan had been completed for the hospital, and while council hadn't been involved, uh, the minister undertook that council would receive a copy of that master plan. I took Dr Lynham at his word, and we have contacted the health department to follow up on Dr Lynham's commitment for a copy of the master plan, but they have said no, they would not be able to share it with council. So we've repeatedly requested a copy of that master plan, 27th of February, the 30th of April, the 14th of May, the 7th and the 3rd of June. And despite being assured by Dr Lynham uh, that we would be able to receive that information, I have now been told that it would not be released to Council. It is, in fact, very, very disappointing. Uh, and last week I met with the Community Alliance Union and updated them on Council's progress for the preliminary design. I conveyed to them that Councillor Hammond has been strongly advocating for funding uh, to construct uh, or to make a contribution towards the construction of signalised lights at the intersection. Uh, I let them know that the work we had undertaken uh, and that we also, unfortunately, were not able to receive a copy of the master plan. So I had to let them know that without these details, without a copy of the master plan, without the traffic modelling that would underpin that master plan, Council will not be able to properly complete these preliminary design works that we have undertaken to do. So I note that Dr Lynham said that they are going to build two new car parks. Under, the town, under their planning exemption. So there'll be about 750 spaces in each, so a total of 1,500 spaces. They will both be accessed to and from our road network. Wherever they would be, we do not know. What roads they will access, what times they will be used, again, we do not know. We are seeking to assist. We want to work with the hospital, but without this information, this precise detailed information, we cannot properly design Cooper, infrastructure for the future needs of this community. Thank you. Thanks, Mr Chair. My question is to the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, the local government infrastructure plan identifies quite a few large sites around inner city Brisbane to be acquired for the purposes of public parkland. In many cases, these sites are owned by large companies that know that their land will continue to rise in value over the coming years. Some of these sites are due to be acquired by council no later than 2021. Now, if these owners know that their land value is continuing to rise, they're not going to be willing to sell. So my question to council is, what plans do you have to acquire these sites if indeed some of these companies don't wish to be relocated out of the inner city because they're making more money just simply waiting there for their land values to continue rising. Lord Mayor. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Three, for the question. And it is a good question, and it is a fair question. Um, 
In terms of the parks that we've identified in the LGIP, the Local Government in Infrastructure Plan, uh, there is indicative timeframes associated with parkland. Uh, part of that has to do with the pace of development in a particular area and the expect anticipated growth of an area. Uh, so sometimes areas can grow faster than we anticipated, sometimes they can grow slower than we anticipated. So the LGIP provides an estimate on uh, when growth will occur and when particular infrastructure uh, may be required. The LGIP, though, requires us to make acquisitions, uh, if necessary, on a compulsory basis. Now, we would always seek to uh, go in and acquire land um, by agreement. That's our first approach when we acquire property. Uh, but if, for some reason, um, that is not a course of action open to us for various reasons, uh, we can have the option of uh, a compulsory acquisition. So that is something that is in the many different tools that we have available to us to progress the acquisition of parkland. And so you've seen coming through this chamber uh, many different options when, when we buy new parkland. Some of them have been by agreement when we buy new land. Some have been by compulsory acquisition. And so we will uh, make sure that uh, as the development of the city occurs, we provide new parkland. We are planning for that new parkland through the Local Government Infrastructure Plan and through our new Green Future Fund, funded by the dividends of the CBIC. Uh, the City of Brisbane Investment Corporation. And so we are there. We have uh, multiple programs of purchasing new land for parkland and for uh, turning unused land into parkland uh, or underutilised land uh, into parkland. So uh, we will continue to roll out record investment in parkland. Uh, if we need to uh, have some compulsory acquisitions as part of that process, then we will certainly pursue those options where they're appropriate. Uh, but as I said, uh, Councillor Sri, in the first instance, we prefer to acquire land uh, by agreement with the owner. And uh, when we acquire land, we do so on a fair basis. Now, um, I know that Councillor Sri doesn't think developers have the same rights that other people do. But if you're a landowner, you have a right to a fair value on that land. Um, so uh, just because someone might be a developer doesn't mean they're not entitled to a fair value on the land that they own. Um, they have the same rights as any other kind of owner, whether it's a private owner-occupier or whether uh, it is a corporation. Uh, ultimately, we are bound by uh, the requirement to give someone fair market value. So uh, we will progress through the, um, through the processes that we have. Uh, first instance acquiring by agreement and the second instance compulsory acquisition if that is necessary. So I hope that answers your question, Councillor Shree. Further questions, Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, my question is to the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee, Councillor Hammond. Uh, Councillor Hammond, over the weekend, the Lord Mayor announced this administration would create the largest new park Brisbane has ever seen in the past 50 years. Uh, Councillor you Johnston, you, you arrived a minute ago, please. We missed you. Please, it's just uh, can you please, Councillor Richards? Please continue. Councillor Hammond, can you outline what this will mean for residents and for Brisbane as a clean and green city? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Councillor Richards, for the question. I'd be delighted to answer it. As you know, on Sunday, the 9th of June, 2019, the Lord Mayor Adrian Schrinner and I, accompanied by Councillor Maddock and Councillor Howard. Um, announced this exciting new project up at Victoria Park. Um, the Lord Mayor announced that Council will be turning Victoria Park Golf Course into the biggest park we've seen in 50 years, more than double the size of the City Botanical Gardens and the CBD. The Victoria Park Golf Course will become public parkland and to um, also complement the places that are already up there. It's important to note that the popular putt-putt, driving range, um, function centre and bistro will all be staying up at Victoria Park. We will be consulting with our community um, and going out in a couple of months, I believe, Lord Mayor, to consult with the community to see what they would like to see this park transformed into. This is going to be a massive public asset. It's not only going to be for the golf, golf players anymore, it's going to be opened up 
to everybody with all abilities and all ages. I'm excited to start this consultation process, um, Lord Mayor, um, and deliver your vision and the vision of Brisbane. Um, this, this project will include all of Victoria Park, including both sides of the inner city bypass. Um, after, after the public consultation carries through, it will be about two years before the public golf course actually shuts down. So we'll be working, doing up a vision for this park. There may be some planning um, that we have to do that might in, um, include going through your area, Councillor Burke, but this is what we're going to do. The Brisbane Metro is going to complement this site and make it more public and active transport friendly. There's also bikeways through this park. Lord Mayor, I'm so excited about this announcement and I cannot wait to work with the community and see what their vision for our city is. Thank you. Further questions? Councillor Cook. Thank you, Mr Chair. My question is for the Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, you and your LNP administration have ripped out $45 million in rates from the Morningside Ward in the last financial year. You have reinvested a mega $5 million back in capital spending. Residents and businesses in my ward have been fighting a 10-year campaign which has included five petitions to get this Quirk Schrinner LNP administration to fix the Corso shopping precinct in Seven Hills. You have now announced that my residents in Seven Hills will have one of the highest rate rises in the city at 5.8 per cent. Lord Mayor, where is my residence $45 million and what do you have against the residents in Seven Hills who have been campaigning for the Corso precinct upgrade for over 10 years? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chair, for uh, the question. Uh, and the answer to that question is uh, I've got absolutely nothing against anyone at all because this budget that will come down tomorrow will be a budget for the whole city and it'll be a city uh, a city shaping budget that delivers new infrastructure uh, that invests in new green space uh, that provides better public transport uh, including free public transport in off-peak times for seniors in seven hills in fact and seniors in every single suburb of brisbane uh, there are a number of new initiatives in this budget which will benefit all residents across the city which will be accessible to all residents across the city. Uh, but, Councillor uh, Cook, um, you uh, talked about rate increases in particular suburbs, and uh, Labor has a record of very deceptively and mischievously trying to suggest that Council suddenly or somehow decides that one area should get a different rate to another. That is not what happens. That is not how the rating system works. If you turn to the back of the budget book tomorrow, you will see the rate in the dollar for owner-occupier properties. And does it say one rate in the dollar for Seven Hills and a different rate in the dollar for Wool and Gabba? No. no. It is the same rate in the dollar for every single property in the owner-occupier category across Brisbane. We rate all properties the same and the only differences between properties or between suburbs is based on state government land valuations. So if rates in Seven Hills are going up higher than the average, it's because the valuations in Seven Hills, according to the state government, are going up higher than the average. That is the only reason. And so her area and that area of Seven Hills is doing uh, really well when it comes to the property market. Uh, the valuations in that area are increasing very healthily, and that is a good thing. That is a good thing because, in the end, uh, uh, councillors Chair. like Order, Councillor Cook. Cook. Uh, can you bring the Lord Mayor back, back to the question? I just wanted to know where my residence, $45 million, was. Thank you. Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, and so, when areas in your ward do well, you should be supportive of that. You should be excited about that. If areas are going ahead, that is something we should all celebrate. Uh, but, uh, Mr Chair, um, Labor will continue to try and play politics with this. They will try to misuse information, misrepresent the facts, uh, and that is their game. That is what they always play. They've played at every budget. They've tried to indicate to residents that somehow different suburbs get treated differently. No, they all get rated the same. 
They all get rated the same rate in the dollar. That is a fact. That is an indisputable Answers fact. Answers will be heard in silence. I didn't hear yeah. Councillor Cook complaining uh, when the Seven Hills Theatre and Community Hub no, was established. No. I didn't hear her complaining about that, about that investment. I didn't hear about that. Now, if you have a look at every suburb across the city, uh, there, is, um, there are projects that happen from year to year, and there's rises and falls in those projects based on the competing needs of different areas around the suburbs. Uh, one year, a suburb will get far more investment than the amount of rates paid by that suburb. The next year, it might be different. This is the nature, this is the nature of a growing city. But those residents also benefit from the wide range of citywide services and facilities that are open and accessible to everyone. Who is going to pay for them? Across the city, uh, we all contribute uh, to facilities like our 33 libraries. Uh, we all contribute to the cost of city cats, of buses, uh, of cross river ferries. Uh, we all contribute to uh, the waste collection services that are provided, the grass cutting that is done, uh, the road resurfacing and the footpath maintenance and all of those things which happen right across the city on an ongoing basis. We all contribute to them and we all get a citywide benefit from them. And so uh, to try and simplistically portray this as, oh, uh, we should only, uh, it should be a zero sum game with the rates that we pay and the rates we get back in the ward don't take into account all of those citywide things that council does. And more importantly, council, uh, Councillor Cook and her colleagues come into this chamber on a regular basis talking about um, <laughs> staff, staff EBAs, staff wage rises, staff conditions. Order, Mr. Mr. Chair. Who's going to pay our staff? Mayor, Who's going to pay our staff? Further questions, Councillor Marks. Yes, thank you, Chair. My question is to the Chair of Field Services Committee, Councillor Howard. Councillor Howard, the introduction of a waste levy across many of Queensland's councils will come into effect from 1 July this year. While council will receive a rebate on waste collected from residents, can you outline what this levy will mean for council's projects? Councillor Howard. Well, uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank Councillor Marks for her question. Uh, as you stated, the levy will begin on 1 July at a rate of $75 per tonne for general waste. $155 per tonne for Category 1 regulated waste and $105 per tonne for Category 2 regulated waste. These amounts are in addition to the standard disposal rate. The Labor State Government Waste Levy is designed to encourage resource recovery and recycling activities over contemporary landfill practices. And let me be clear, Chair, that even prior to this levy, this administration has always been committed to waste minimisation and resource recovery. It's as simple as that. When we turn our attention to projects that this levy creates a big burden for, we must consider the cost implications for businesses in the construction industry. This Labor State government has only in recent months said that this levy will not cost Council anything. Well, this couldn't be further from the truth. Most, if not all, construction works have some form of waste which will be diverted to landfill. Let us consider the costs associated with existing projects as a result of this waste levy. Costs which could be more than 10 to $20 million. In fact, the state government itself will also be faced with significant cost impacts on their new projects like Cross River Rail and Queen's Wharf because of the levy. Some of the council projects potentially impacted by this levy include the Ascot Park upgrade, the Milton Urban Common, the Wynnum Skate Park, the Murray Recreational Hub and the Boondall Wetlands Environment Centre, and that's just to name a few. Now, I'm sure, Chair, that councillors in this chamber today could think of many far more important and beneficial projects these unanticipated funds could be spent on. While Council has mechanisms in place to support the recovery and reuse of some construction bride products, it is not always possible to do this for all materials. It should be noted that regulated waste can involve chemical contamination and there are limited disposal sites. Gate fees associated with regular waste disposal vary between $600 a tonne to $1,200 per tonne prior to any additional levy costs. 
Removal of waste material to an off-site cycling centre may incur additional costs, including transportation costs and plant recycling fees. It's likely that an assessment by the contractor will have to be made with regards to the location of the recycling plant to the project site compared to a waste facility location. So ultimately, any increase in construction costs is highly likely to put pressure on existing project budgets and contract values. In saying this, it is likely that not only will the waste levy be passed on to Council, but also the contractors' costs associated with managing the introduction of the waste levy. This then leads me to the cost implications for ratepayers. In her media statement on 14 February 2019, the Minister for Environment and the Great Barrier Reef, Minister for Science and the Minister for Arts, the Hon. Leanne Enoch, said, the Palaszczuk, the Palaszczuk government is also standing by our commitment that Queenslanders will not have to pay more to take out their wheelie bin every week. We are providing advance payments to councils over and above the rate of household waste that goes to landfill to ensure the costs are not passed on to ratepayers. Labor's magic pudding economics doesn't seem to understand that extra costs resulting from the waste levy on projects must be recouped. Money does not magically appear from the abyss. There are always indirect costs that come because of these types of levies, and as the Lord Mayor has said previously, if there are costs over and above what has been anticipated, then we will be sending that bill to the state government. Our council endeavours to assist reducing ratepayers' costs of living, but with this new waste levy and its impacts on construction, it is going to become increasingly problematic. Council intends on establishing a working group to deal with the Queensland government's waste levy. I finish by stating that only this administration can be trusted to deliver our commitment for a clean, green and sustainable city for residents and businesses alike. Further questions? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, my question is to Lord Mayor. Lord Mayor, given that your administration has wasted $100 million and counting on cost blowouts since the last election on projects like Kingston Smith Drive, Technology One, the Zip Line, Green Camp Road and Anzac Square, amongst others. Will you now apologise to the people of Brisbane for a rates rise that is 70 per cent higher than inflation to cover your financial mismanagement? Lord Mayor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, well, thank you, Councillor Cumming, through you, Mr Chairman. Uh, first of all, the figure that was given by Councillor Cumming is incorrect. Uh, is incorrect. Um, if you want to talk about cost blowouts, uh, the Queensland State Government is competing for the Olympics. They are the Olympic world champions of cost blowouts. And we just saw recently the IT cost blowouts. Isn't it fascinating? These guys opposite here were harping on uh, about this sort of thing here just a short time Point ago. Order, Yet Chairman. their colleagues Point up order, the road... Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, under the meeting's local laws, um, the Lord Mayor is not allowed to argue the question. He must answer it. Um, the question was about rates, not the state government, and I, for one, am interested in an answer about the rates issue for our yeah. residents. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, I was actually referring to a part of the question which was factually incorrect, uh, Mr Chair, and the claim of uh, the incorrect claim of $100 million in cost blowouts. They're making this stuff up. They're making this stuff up. Uh, so, uh, but we, we do know that Labor is the uh, champions of cost blowouts. We have seen there's never been an IT project that Labor has touched that hasn't blown out. And uh, Queensland Health, well, they're, they're going through it again. Tens of millions order, of dollars Mr. in Chairman. cost blowouts under the order, hand of Councilor Labor. Johnston. Uh, Mr Chairman, I note you did not make a ruling on my previous point of order, and I again draw your attention to the fact that the Lord Mayor is arguing um, the question rather than answering the question, as he is required to do under the meeting's local law. The, the question is about rate rises and um, cost blowouts. That's what the Lord Mayor is discussing. But I will take a moment to remind the Lord Mayor that he's not permitted to debate the content of the question, but answer the question. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. So uh, the question referred to uh, an incorrect figure on cost blowouts. It also referred to inflation and it referred to rates. Uh, it referred to rates. So there were three components to that question. Uh, and I've got to say, I won't stand up here and let incorrect information go unchallenged. That's the reality. I will not let that go unchallenged. But it's, it's also been interesting because 
Um, Labor can't seem to decide on what the inflation rate is as well, um, because uh, the state budget, the state budget, um, or the state government shows their inflation of 1.7 per cent, and their estimated inflation going forward in 1920 is 2 per cent. Uh, yet Labor's banding around this figure about three times the rate of inflation. Well, first decide what the rate of inflation is uh, before, before, well, Councillor Cummings said 1.5, Councillor Cassidy said 1.3. They cannot agree on what the inflation is. The state government said 1.7 today. Uh, well, yeah, Councillor Cumming appears to be the one that has done his research, um, but look, uh, certainly Councillor Cassidy hasn't. They can't agree on an inflation rate, but they just make stuff up. They put out incorrect figures. They make claims about three times the rate of inflation. Once again, that is incorrect. It is incorrect. Uh, so I also know when it comes to rates, the question was also about rates. That was the third component of the Point question. Point of order. Point of order, Councillor Cumming. Plain to be misrepresented. <laughs> Well, he, um, he mentioned rates. All right, I'll note that. Well, it, yeah. it comes at the end anyway. So. No, no, Councillor Cassidy said that. Councillor Cassidy is reported in the media and on social media as saying three times the rate of inflation. So, look, these, these guys are all over the shop. But another example of Labor being all over the shop is Councillor Cummings question about rates. He has stood up in this place and on the record said that rates should be linked to the, the wage cost increases for our staff. He has said that. He has said that rates should go up in line with the increases that we're paying our staff. Now, we've got many staff in this organisation. They are getting a 2.5 per cent pay increase. That is something that I assume Labor supports because it's under the EBA that we've all uh, agreed to. They're getting a 2.5 per cent wage increase. Our staff, Labor supports that. Councillor Cummings said rates should be linked to that. What, I mean, th these guys need to choose a position. They need to pick a position and stick to it. And, and look, the, the, farce, the farce gets worse because uh, Labor was out there just a little while ago saying this rates increase was artificially low. And now, and now apparently I have to apologise for the rates increase. Uh, look, <laughs> Mr Chairman, um, Labor are once again trying to run a political strategy. Uh, they're coming from all over the shop. They can't agree on what their arguments or points are. All they want to do is just throw mud and attack. They've got nothing positive to offer for this city. They've only got negativity. Uh, this administration, on the other hand, is focused on delivering a budget which will build a better Brisbane, build the infrastructure, the public transport, the new bridges, the public transport infrastructure and ferries uh, that this city needs and deliver the new parkland and green space this city needs as it grows. That's our focus, not on petty party politics. Um, um, thank you, Lord Mayor. Look, um, Councillor Cumming, I think you can only call a misrepresentation if you've spoken in the debate at that time. Right, so um, can I have uh, further questions, please? Councillor Cunningham. My question is to the Chair of the Public and Active Transport and Economic Development Committee, Councillor Adams. Deputy Mayor, over the weekend, the Lord Mayor announced a package to inject new life into Brisbane suburbs. Can you explain how backing small businesses will help create a city of neighbourhoods and rejuvenate local retail precincts? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Mr Chair, and thank you, Councillor Cunningham, for the question. I am very excited for the, some of the initiatives that we have announced already for our economic development of Brisbane and, of course, for that more than 80 per cent of our small businesses that we have in Brisbane, eight, more than 80 per cent of businesses we have in Brisbane that are small to medium enterprises. We are making sure that we are going to be working with our local businesses to bring our suburbs back to life in those 124,000 of them that we have right across the city. We are determined to make sure that we have got a better Brisbane tomorrow than we do today. That means giving residents more opportunities to enjoy Brisbane's beautiful climate and connect with families and friends and make sure that they can get around the city easy with our announcements on travel for seniors to visit those wonderful places that we're going to be working with the local community on. We know when local businesses are strong, our local communities are stronger. That's why we are slashing the fees that the most heavily impact our cafes and our restaurants 
wants in the suburbs across Brisbane, like footpath dining permits, food van licences, market stall fees and business advertising applications, the ones that really do hit those small businesses in the pockets. And it has been amazing to see the feedback already from Saturday on social media um, from those businesses saying, yes, that's exactly what we've been asking for and very excited about this opportunity we will have now to free up some of that cash for our businesses as well. We also want to see the opportunities to work with our small businesses to encourage startups in the suburbs, work with those shopping centres that we've got right across the city to make sure we can activate those shop fronts and work about making people in their suburbs have more to see and do as well. Some of the fee reductions we're talking about is halving the annual footpath dining fees for new cafes and restaurants, making it easier to access outdoor dining permits, saving about $670 on those permits so residents have even more opportunity to get out in that alfresco dining in this beautiful weather that we have as well. We're also looking at halving the food business licence fees for new cafes and restaurants, providing more dining options in the suburbs as well. Reducing these fees is just one way Council is supporting business in the suburbs and working to bring new life to our suburban retail areas. I had the great pleasure last Thursday night on joining uh, the graduates uh, from Impact Boom's social enterprise program that we have been supporting over the last two years now, the third year of a social enterprise program, where Tom Allen and the team a team of about 30 mentors from across businesses and companies in Brisbane, supporting young and sometimes not so young entrepreneurs in their social enterprise to step them up to that next level, to get them the business acumen they need to be able to pitch their product to people that have the capital that are able to support them in their enterprises. We saw some fantastic opportunities to work with these people, not only across Brisbane, but within council as well. So we had uh, B one third that I think were the winners of the People's Choice that night, but are already speaking to City Smart to make us realise that one third of the food that we put into our mouth actually has been grown with the pollination of a bee. So beehives are very unpopular in Brisbane, and I think if you're a local community like mine, onto a lot of bushland, beehives are becoming more and more popular. Getting them to spread the word of pollination and growing your own food within our community gardens and across the city as well. We have NaviSafe, an app to get people out and about with guided tours for those with vision impaired in our beautiful natural areas. Again, something that we'll be talking to inclusive communities about. And then someone like Motley Bunch, a lady who was in corporate business five years ago, had an epiphany and decided she could do better. She went to so many events and saw these beautiful flowers off on one event being thrown in the bin. She now gathers those, events, those flowers from those events and then delivers them. To, um, to women's shelters, to aged care facilities, to hospitals for those who may not be actually getting those flowers as well. That was just three of 15 fantastic ideas, and we are going to be working with another group in the coming financial year of graduates or 15 that can come through and work with the uh, producer that we have of that program to make sure that they are ready. They are shopfront ready. We have the opportunities to link them with our empty, empty shop fronts and make sure that we advance our community. On top of that, we've seen the recent announcements around strategic procurement to make sure that we are looking at local buy. Local buy will also support those small to medium enterprises. On top of that, our $4 million commitment Deputy to Mayor, social enterprises. Expired. Thank you, Mr Chair. That concludes question time. Can I draw the Council's attention to the Establishment and Coordination Committee report of the 3rd of June? Lord Mayor. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee me meeting held on Monday, 3rd of June 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, the report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting dated Monday, the 3rd of June 2019 be adopted. Lord Mayor, is there any debate? Point of order. Uh, yes, Point of Mr. order Chair. to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, um, I refer the Lord Mayor to item C, the contracts and tendering report, and page nine, um, it's contract number 22, Master Media Advertising Services. Um, could the Lord Mayor please explain what the $3.6 million is that is being allocated towards this media contract? Lord Mayor. 
Okay, uh, thank you. That question's been noted. Um, I have no doubt that question will be addressed during this discussion. But first, um, look, I wanted to make an apology. Um, I misrepresented Labor councillors. Uh, I claimed that Labor councillors had newsletters going out with seven photographs on. I got it wrong. Nine photographs on Councillor Cook's. Um, and it was actually six on Councillor Cassidy's. So Councillor Cassidy was like restraining himself um, in his newsletter. But the reality is this line that they keep pushing that it's okay for them to do something, but it's not okay for the Lord Mayor to do something is absolute hypocrisy. They are communicating with their electorate. That is their right and responsibility to do as an elect. Councillors will be heard in silence. La Councillor Cassidy. La Labor's, Labor's comment here continue. says it all. They said it was my budget. It's not my budget. It's the ratepayers' budget, just like their ward budget is the ratepayers' budget. It's not their budget. It's the ratepayers' budget. It all comes from the same source, Councilors which is will be heard the rates silence. that people pay. I can understand why Labor councillors aren't happy. They've really gotten it wrong today. Uh, the, the reality is they have a responsibility as local councillors to communicate with their electors. Uh, they have anywhere from 26,000 or more electors in each ward. Uh, I have 756,000 electors that I need to communicate with in the same way that they do. That's right. So, so, and, and, and there is no, it, like, the semantics about which pot of money it comes from is ridiculous. This is all ratepayers' money. It all comes from the same source. All right, councillors, please allow the Lord Mayor to address the issues. And so the suggestion that somehow uh, the Lord Mayor should not be able to communicate with the people of Brisbane about the agenda going forward, the projects that will uh, benefit or affect them, uh, the initiatives in the budget, which the ratepayers are contributing towards financially, uh, is just a ludicrous suggestion. It is a ludicrous suggestion. Uh, and it is one set of rules for them and another for us. So whenever the Labor councillors sign up to putting out newsletters without their photos on, then we'll, consider, we'll reconsider our approach too. Uh, but, uh, Councillor Cumming, I think it was, said, oh, it would never happen at the state government level. Well, you know, there, there is a flyer here that was put out across the Mount Cuthar electorate using taxpayer funds, which has two photos of the Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk. And, and this is not a Labor Party brochure. It doesn't refer to the Labor Party anywhere. It is not authorised anywhere. Not this there. came from a, an electorate office funded by the ratepayers, and it talks about the Cross River Rail project, and it has two photos of the Premier on it. And it talks about only Anastasia Palaszczuk and her government will deliver Cross River Rail. So their suggestion that the state government would never do this is wrong, is wrong. And you know what? I respect the right of the member for Mount Cutha at the time to distribute that material. It's part, it's part of the information and engagement process that is important in our democracy. Now, we know that Labor, they have real trouble winning elections by fair play. They have to change the rules. Right. Just like the union campaigns they run about changing the rules, if they can't win on a level playing field, they have to try and tip the goalposts in their favour. And so they want to communicate with their electors, but they don't want us to be able to communicate with our electors. That's really what they're saying. Just like they want their state colleagues to change the electoral system in their favour. Just like they want to fiddle around uh, with electoral funding laws. The reality is they're doing it for one reason only, to give themselves a political advantage and to rig the next election. Now, if they don't have enough opportunities to rig the next election already, based on what's on the table. Lord Mayor, that's pretty strong language. Can you, can you bring it forward? Oh, look, I, no, I stand by the claim that Labor are trying to rig the next election. Uh, I've said it before, and I will say it again. They are trying point, to point rig order, the next Mr. election. Yep. Uh, point of order to you, Councillor I think that, that goes way, way beyond impugning motive. I, I would ask that you, I as am the chair, imputing motive. as the chair, 
that would you as the chair please uh, request that the Lord Mayor withdraw that comment. And if he doesn't, and Mr Chair— well, hang on, he's... Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. Okay. I have, uh, before you stood up, I did ask the Mayor to tone down his language. I'll ask him to withdraw. Lord Mayor, will he withdraw? Mr Chair, I have said this in the chamber on the record. It's in the minutes before. Uh, the Labor state government is trying to rig the, the election going forward by changing the electoral law, laws by well, various I, other so-called reforms. ask you to be more circum circumspect and proportional in going into the future, please? That is my view, Mr Chair. And I don't Point of order, Mr Chairman. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, Mr Chairman, it's clearly an act of disorder under section 21 of the meeting's local law uh, to use um, indecent or offensive language yeah. or to make a statement adversely reflecting on the character of pretty much anybody or failing to comply with the direction uh, given by you. Um, it, it's not appropriate for someone to claim that an election is being rigged. And I would ask that you direct the Lord Mayor to withdraw that comment. I've, as as you've, you've heard me say only moments ago, that I've asked certain actions to occur and I'd like the Lord Mayor Okay. Take those into consideration, please. Mr. Chair, you have asked a uh, you've asked me to withdraw, and I will withdraw. I will rephrase in a more circumspect manner. The Australian Labor Party, with the help of their colleagues up in George Street, are changing the rules to specifically benefit themselves at the next council elections. And there is more than enough evidence that that is occurring. And we've been really clear. We've had big debates in this place about it. So, hey, Councillor Johnston, Councillor Johnston, please, t -t just don't yell out for no reason, please. Lord Mayor. So, uh, yeah, look, that, that, that is my view. There is enough evidence to support that. And in fact, all the evidence comes from the things that have come out of Labor Party reports of Councillor Cummings' own mouth, uh, the reality is they advocated for these changes because it will give them a political benefit. How, how clear is that? It is very clear. Yet they don't, like, they don't like to be caught out on the way that they operate, on the sneaky, manipulative way that they are operating. And so, look, uh, you know, I withdraw my claim about rigging. I simply put it that they are trying to blatantly change the rules in their favour. Some people would call that rigging. It's, you know, in the end, it's up to you how you interpret that. But that's what's happening here, and I firmly believe that. Uh, but, Mr. Chair, um, the the reality is, uh, going forward, um, Labor continues to focus on party politics, on political games, and we continue to focus on the infrastructure our city needs for the future, uh, and that's what. Tomorrow's budget is all about. That is what our team's focus is all about, uh, and we will remain committed to that. Now, whatever might happen in March next year uh, is a matter for the people, and I support the democratic process. I don't support, I don't support uh, unnecessary uh, manipulative changes to the system, but I support the democratic process, and it should be free and fair. Uh, but whatever happens, uh, we are well and truly focused on the next five to ten years going forward. We're focused on uh, building five new green bridges. Uh, this is not something that's going to be delivered before the next election. This is a long-term plan for the city. We're focused on delivering new parkland. We are focused on those long-term things that matter and make a difference to the people of Brisbane and their lifestyle and their quality of living. And that, that's what really matters uh, going forward. We've had um, a busy week in the city of Brisbane uh, across the suburbs. There's been a lot of exciting things happening uh, in this past week. Uh, one in particular was the Lord Mayor's Tourism Summit, uh, which I attended here in City Hall with uh, well over 100 tourism operators and people in the tourism industry to talk about uh, growing our local tourism opportunities and the exciting things that are happening and how we can help as a city to grow tourism. And I believe that uh, growing tourism is probably the single biggest opportunity we have to grow our local economy uh, because it is an export industry. Uh, we are seeing people from other parts of Australia and other parts of the world investing and spending their money here, and that creates jobs and has a big flow-on effect across the economy. 
And uh, we know that while, particularly while the Australian dollar is lower compared to the US dollar, there's great opportunities here for us to capitalise on tourism. And we are absolutely focused on working with industry to deliver those outcomes. And I know that that, that is shared by everyone in this team. Uh, Another thing that's shared by uh, everyone in this team is a support for our wonderful multicultural community and the many different multicultural groups across uh, Brisbane that make up our diverse community. And uh, this was really evident on Friday night at the Luminous Lantern Parade uh, at South Bank. Uh, this was an incredible event. This literally took my breath away. Uh, so uh, to see, I understand 39 to 40,000 people coming to South Bank to be part of this event is just incredible, just incredible. So uh, last year, we understand that um, there were somewhere between seven and 15,000 people involved, and this year, up to 40,000 people. Um, so it was just incredible, and it was all community groups coming together, organised by the MDA, Multicultural Development Association, with the support of Brisbane City Council, the support of the state government and uh, a range of different sponsors. And it was just a fantastic event for the city um, and one that uh, we look forward to continuing to support. Uh, we um, had the first koala festival on the weekend as well out um, at Maricobat East uh, on land that was purchased through the Bushland Acquisition Program. Uh, on land that we are adding to our green space and parkland. Lord Mayor, your time's expired. Move for an extension. Extension of time has been moved by Councillor Adams. Seconded. Seconded. Seconded, by, seconded by Councillor Marks. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, on land that uh, we purchased through the Bushland Acquisition Program, adding to our green space, adding to our conservation reserves, um, adding to that precinct and corridor that links into Whites Hill, that links into Bulimba Creek. Uh, and it was fantastic to see the local interest. So residents rolled up, not to see a koala, um, but to plant trees, to plant native trees. And within about an hour and a half, yep. Councillor Adams, two and a half thousand native trees were planted. Just people rolling up, rolling up their sleeves, getting their hands dirty. Uh, and it was great to have Councillor Adams and Councillor Fiona Cunningham there, uh, also the federal member Ross Vasta, um, and many local community groups, including the B4C and representatives from Lone Pine, uh, there to support the first koala festival. It was a raging success and just shows that the community shares our view and our desire to make sure that Brisbane is the koala capital of Australia. And they, they're prepared not only to support that ambition, but to get involved in that ambition as well by planting native trees and supporting the work that council is doing. Uh, it was also a pleasure to be uh, with Councillor Toomey up, uh, up in the gap on uh, Saturday to help him open up his new dog off leash area um, at Patton Park. Now this is a dog off leash area that is that, that in fact made me jealous. Um, after serving for 13 years as a local councillor myself, um, I've seen a lot of good dog off leash areas, but this one was the best I've ever seen. And incorporated into the design was um, a giant sand pit for the dogs to play in, and they loved it. Um, unfortunately, though, I couldn't stop um, Monash and Wolfgang playing in the sand pit as well. And um, never know what they found in that sand pit, I can say that. Um, but it was a fantastic event. Credit to uh, Councillor Toomey for bringing the uh, community consultation on that particular upgrade to fruition, rolling it out, and, and such a fantastic uh, community outcome there. Also, it was great to be part of the Eid Down, Eid Down Under Festival uh, at the uh, Islamic College of Brisbane with Councillor Marks uh, and Councillor Angela Owen as well. Um, and it was, there was a great roll up to that event, um, and it's getting bigger and bigger every year. And in particular, thanks to um, Councillor Marks for setting up a stall and staying, staying the whole day, um, engaging with her local uh, Muslim community. Moving through to the um, uh, official items on the agenda here, uh, going to item A first. Item A is a new lease for the Crushers Leagues Club. On the 2nd of March 2018, a new one-year licence to Crushers Leagues Club was granted for the former Stafford Bowls Club 
premises. The previous tenant was Stafford's Bo Stafford Bowls Club, um, and they vacated the, the premises on the 30th of November 2016 due to declining membership and increasing operating expenses. Council conducted an EOI process in November 2016 to identify a suitable, eligible organisation to reactivate and manage the facility for community benefit. Uh, and yet another example, uh, Mr Chair, of how uh, we work with community organisations to open up these community facilities. And yes, sometimes bowls clubs uh, str struggle financially, sometimes they are forced to shut down, uh, but we make sure that they're reactivated and reused for a, uh, another community or sporting purposes. And this is an example of that. So Crushers were the successful applicant, uh, and they have proposed to invest approximately $4.7 million to refurbish the facility, including a new multi-purpose uh, multi undercover sports surface, upgrading the existing lawn bowls green, new carpets, new furniture, internal and external painting, and upgrading the function rooms. Given this significant $4.7 million investment, uh, Council has, uh, they've requested a 20-year lease through Council. Um, Crushers has also committed $50,000 per annum to maintain the neighbouring rugby fields to support the activities of the Gibson Park Committee, uh, and they will also provide $150,000 per annum in sponsorship to local families and clubs to assist with the costs of participation uh, in sport. On the 4th of April 2019, Council approved a development application for a material change of use to permit a reconfiguration of lot to allow the crushers to commence building works on the premises. These works are proposed to be commenced uh, next month. An acceptable new lease application has been submitted by crushers for the 20 year term. And uh, the local councillor, which is Councillor Fiona Hammond, is in support of this uh, proposal. So uh, that's up for discussion and debate today. Uh, we have at item B, the lease of community land to council organisations. Uh, these come through on a regular basis, listing uh, the different organisations that we uh, are entering into leases with. So uh, that's, that information is there for everyone to see. Uh, at item C, we have the Contracts and Tendering Report, uh, which is the regular monthly report that comes through. Item D, uh, we have uh, the Audit Committee Report. Uh, that's presented to Council in line with the City of Brisbane regulation, uh, involving an, the ongoing review of Council's own internal audit report on the operation and risk control measures that we're taking. Uh, and uh, Council, as you know, has an independent audit committee which has been in place for at least 25 years uh, and will continue going forward. Item E is the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan. Uh, this, um, this submission is following the public consultation uh, of October to November last year. Council received 77 submissions. The neighbourhood plan is replacing one of Brisbane's oldest neighbourhood plans. Uh, which was previously adopted in 1990 uh, for a suburb that has been long identified for high density living. Uh, the draft plan retains and provides a different, uh, additional clarification and certainty around building height controls in the Main Street and Thornton Street precincts to preserve views to and from the Story Bridge and Bradfield Highway Deck. Reinforces the residential character of the peninsula, but also allows some small scale non-residential uses to occur to improve the leisure and lifestyle opportunities for those living in Kangaroo Point. It does not increase the amount of land included in the high density residential zone, uh, and in, in fact proposes to rezone some existing high density residential areas to community facilities, specifically uh, for the land under the Story Bridge, uh, which is being uh, rezoned as special purpose utility services. That relates to uh, the land in particular that Council has its depot in for the bridge maintenance and the land running along underneath the Story Bridge. The plan results in two additional properties being protected under the heritage overlay and retains heritage provisions on existing heritage places. And it adds additional landscape features being protected under the significant landscape tree overlay. It maintains the peninsula's open spaces and encourage uh, and anticipates fu a future 
uh, pedestrian and cyclist green bridge connection through to the city, which is obviously one of the bridges that we are committed to building uh, and one of the bridges that we're currently uh, finalising the business case on. Uh, that bridge will absolutely transform the connectivity of Kangaroo Point and particularly the Kangaroo Point Peninsula. It is going to be a game changer for the precinct and we have ensured that this is incorporated into the plan going forward uh, so that council can get on and build this great uh, active travel infrastructure to benefit not only the people of Kangaroo Point but from much wider afield, people coming uh, from that eastern corridor through the area and wanting to get across into the city and to the city botanic gardens. Council has also considered all submissions lodged during the public notification period and made some changes to the draft plan in response to these submissions. The, no the most notable of these changes includes amending the proposed heritage overlay for the former Travel Lodge Hotel at 355 Main Street to reflect the Riverside building only. Uh, I mentioned about the depot already underneath the bridge. Uh, the draft plan also proposes to expand the city frame car parking rate uh, to cover the entire neighbourhood plan area. Obviously, I'm proud to support this neighbourhood plan um, and uh, look forward to the discussion on this document today. Item F is the integrated mass transit service contract. Uh, this was previously the 3G contract between TransLink and Council for the provision of bus services to the city of Brisbane. Uh, it was originally going to be a 4G contract, uh, but despite protracted negotiations, uh, the 3G contract was extended a number of times, uh, and we now have reached an agreement. Lord Mayor, your time has expired. Thank you. Move for an extension. Seconded. Extension of time has been moved by Councillor Adams, seconded by Councillor Richards. All those in favour say aye. 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 To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Lord Mayor, please continue. Uh, thank you. Um, so we now have reached an agreement on all of the terms of the contract and we need council approval to enter into that contract with TransLink. Uh, the term of the contract will be for three years with the option for council to extend uh, for a further year. Uh, compared to the current agreement, many aspects remain the same. However, there are some new inclusions when it comes to reporting and key performance indicators. Uh, as part of the contract, TransLink will also be funding the installation of a telematics system uh, in all of our buses. Telematics will gather, gather fast and reliable intelligence about how the bus is traveling in terms of on-time running and performance. Uh, additionally, the contract also makes sure to include the city loop and city glider services, which are not present in the current contract. The council looks forward to signing the mutual agreement with TransLink to ensure that Brisbane residents can continue to catch uh, public transport across the city in our uh, modern bus fleet, Mr Chair. Item G is the Plumbing and Drainage Act fast track permit work. Uh, this is a pretty basic submission, the state government's new Plum Plumbing and Drainage Act and supporting reg regulation allows a continuation of fast track permit work. The fast track permit allowed under state government reg regulation applies only to low risk plumbing and drainage work that connects directly to the town water and sewerage network. Under the new act, applications lodged under a fast track permit have been reduced in time frame from 10 business days to two business days with some exceptions. To ensure council can continue to offer this service to the industry, the administration is supporting this ENC item. I think that's it, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, uh, in relation to the ENC report, I'd ask that items A, B, C, F and G be dealt with together for voting purposes. And so, uh, likewise, items D and E be dealt with together for voting purposes. All right, so you're saying A through C plus F and G seriatim together, yes. and then D and E seriatim together. Yes. Please Thank continue. you. In relation to item A, the uh, lease of the Crushers Leagues Club, uh, uh, this is a proposed lease of a council park, Gibson Park. Uh, it's located at 352 Stafford Road, Stafford. The previous tenant was of was uh, the Stafford Bowls Club, which is a lawn bowls facility, and uh, they 
vacated the premises back on 30th November 2016, which is some two and a half years ago. Uh, but uh, under this uh, proposal, the Crushers Leagues Club is proposing to spend approximately $4.7 million to refurbish the facility. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any time frame for that work to be carried out, but if there is, uh, happy to hear about it. However, it would be, appear to be in the club's best interest to do this work as soon as possible, as it will make the, I would have thought it would make the club more, more profitable. It's uh, going to be a gaming machine club. Uh, and amongst the upgrades will be some lawn bowl facility, so any uh, members of, uh, of the club wishing to play lawn bowls will still have facilities available. So ex-members of the Stafford Bowls Club and any other people who want to play lawn bowls. So that's all good. Uh, the the uh, Crashers Leagues Club is also required to make a community support contribution each year of at least 200,000 a year, and which is increasing under the formula set out in the uh, document. Uh, the uh, club will also s support local uh, sporting organisations, Stafford District Cricket Club, Padua College, Brothers Junior Rugby League, and uh, and as I said, the remaining members of the Stafford Bowls Club. It will contribute 50000 per annum to maintaining the rugby league fields and $150,000 in sponsorship to local families and clubs to assist with the cost of participating in sport. So, uh, and the Crushers Leagues Club is relocating from address in the Grange uh, because of losses incurred when it uh, ran the NRL franchise some years ago. I wish the Crushers all the best. Um, and. Uh, I do say they have taken on a fairly onerous responsibilities, in my view. Uh, I know the gaming machine market is a very competitive market in most of Brisbane, and certainly not a licence to make money. And, uh, so, and I believe the Crushers uh, Club may be obliged to take on a fair bit of debt uh, to uh, pay for the upgrade. But uh, any arrangement which helps junior sport and bowls is uh, one which we will support, Mr Chair. In relation to uh, item B, uh, the lease of council land to community organisations, this is the uh, necessary legal technicality uh, uh, that's uh, required before uh, before council can uh, enter into leases with uh, with community groups. Uh, this is the one that was sort of ignored or overlooked by council for a number of years, but uh, anyhow, they're on top of it now. Uh, and this one is, seems to be a different uh, way of doing it in that there's a group together some, uh, I counted about 70 organisations, uh, and uh, they've all got the, uh, the exception now, so they can go ahead and uh, enter into a lease. Council can enter into a lease with them without uh, breaking any laws, so that's, that's good. That's good, and there's many worthy community groups in that list, including a couple from Winner Manly Ward. Uh, in relation to uh, item C, the contracts, um, there's 23 contracts and uh, in seven cases uh, some of the unsuccessful tenderers are cheaper than the successful tenderer. So uh, in, the one that stands out is contract two, uh, the margin's some 19.91 per cent. So the uh, unsuccessful tenderer is 19.91 per cent cheaper than the successful tenderer. And uh, they've got a uh, uh, a rating for their uh, VFM. VFM for the uh, unsuccessful tender is 4.7 and for the uh, successful tender is 4.76. Doesn't seem to be a lot of difference there, but anyhow, perhaps uh, whoever's uh, uh, what chair's responsible could explain why that's been the case. There's also a couple of uh, case, three cases. There's only uh, one quote or one tender received, which is always a bit disappointing when the, the uh, system the council uses hasn't generated any, any competition, and uh, that's a bit disappointing again. In relation to item D, the audit committee, well, uh, what more can you say about the audit committee? Uh, I noticed they had a report on SIF and the Ward Footpath and Parks Trust Fund, so it's interesting that that uh, would be considered. And uh, I'd be interested in hearing more uh, about a sort of unfortunate situation, which obviously is of concern to council and should be, uh, but it's... Uh, there was a briefing on the abuse of an aggressive behaviour of substance abuse related issues. Uh, and that's, that's a matter of uh, great concerns uh, to, uh, to anyone uh, working in council and uh, dealing, with the, uh, dealing with the public. In relation to item F, uh, we obviously support council uh, continuing to supply bus services for the uh, state government through TransLink. Uh, it's interesting, some people still 
sort of don't understand that the state government actually pays for most bus services in Brisbane, and uh, the state pays for the buses, the wages the, of the drivers, the fuel, and uh, in return receives the revenue received in fares, but uh, that uh, doesn't in any way, shape or form cover the cost of running the services, and so the state government pay quite a very large uh, subsidy for public transport in Brisbane, and good on them for doing that. And uh, it's, a, it's a shame, it's a shame from time to time that the, uh, this council administration didn't give credit to the state government for the, uh, for the subsidy that they're providing. But uh, you know, as I said, uh, unfortunately uh, they have a, this attitude that it's, uh, uh, they're not prepared to give any credit to uh, the state government, which is uh, most unfortunate. And uh, then they complain when they have difficulties in dealing with the state government. Well, anyhow. Uh, the, uh, in relation to item G, uh, this is another legal technicality which is councils required to comply with under the new Plumbing and Drainage Act, and uh, we support the action being taken. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I rise to speak on item A, and I do want to correct the record from Councillor Cummings. Um, the club, the old crushers site, was he was correct at the Grange. Um, a little bit of history on this site. It was given um, to Rugby League. I'm not going to mention the club. It was actually given to back then. Um, the land was given by the Hickey family. It was known as Corbett Park, where there was extensive sporting fields attached to what then became Crushers Leagues Club. Um, that land was privately owned and sold off with the full support of Councillor Hinchcliffe at the time, um, where Councillor Hinchcliffe supported the, their fields turning into um, townhouses um, because he said in the original DA of that site were those ample sports fields in that area. So it's a sad loss for the Grange, er um, Grange area to have lost that sports, those sports fields um, that was fully supported by the ALP Council at the time. Um, the club crushers did not fail because of their affiliation to league. I'm not sure where that came from. Um, the days of um, clubs and, and dining facilities and, and whatever in back streets across our city um, have long gone. Um, the, there was no affiliation with the sport of league that made them fail at that spot. Um, I am absolutely delighted that um, crushers are going in to the old Stafford Bowls Club. You've got to remember that in 2016, the Bowls Club was suffering and council did step in and help them. They voluntarily handed in their keys. Um, there was lots of proposals at that time for high-rise development on that stage where developers came swooping into the Stafford Bowls Club. This is council land. I am delighted. It's council land. It's different to what those opposite say. This was council-owned land. We went out for tender and crushers came with a winning tender. They're investing $4.7 million into this site. Um, Councillor Cumming said, when's it starting? The Lord Mayor clearly said it's going to start in the next month, um, the sod turning and whatever at this site. What is also um, brilliant about this um, um, concept that Crushers Leagues Club are doing is they're investing into the Gibson Park Committee, Councillor Cummings. They're not investing into Padua College or to Brothers or to the cricket. It's the committee, the Gibson Park Committee. Point of order, uh, Mr Chairman. Point of order, Councillor Cummings. Claim to be misrepresented. Councillor Hammond. I'm not sure how he was misunderstood because he clearly said that they're investing into Padua College, into Brothers Rugby League Football Club, and to the Stafford Cricket. They are the Crushers Leagues are supporting the Gibson Park Committee. They are also investing into young families into the area to get into sport to help people get healthy and active and to play sport. There was a famous quote um, from Kevin Sheedy, and I'm not an AFL follower, but it made sense. Kevin Sheedy said that 90 per cent of children and our youth get into trouble because they have never played team sport. Point of order, I Mr Chair. 
Point of order, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Hammond take a question? Councillor Hammond, will you take a question? No, I will no, later Councillor though, Councillor Shree. Talk to you afterwards. Councillor Hammond, um, please continue. I am delighted that this Crusher's site are investing in the youth of today for tomorrow. We need kids to be more healthy and active. I cannot wait for this facility to open up and bring the bowlers back on this site with a brand new refreshing um, build on this site, the $4.7 million investment into a council asset. Thank you, Mr Chair. Councillor Cumming. Thank you. Uh, to, uh, sorry, sorry, right. Councillor Cumming, just to the misrepresentation, please. Yes. Yes. Uh, I said that uh, the uh, uh, crushes were relocating due to costs incurred. That's what's stated in paragraph 7 of the ENC. Uh, it's a shame Councillor Hammond didn't read it. And uh, the uh, lease document, the draft lease which document, uh, ENC clause A, attachment B, uh, the organisation, which is Crushes League Club, has confirmed it will support local sporting organisations, Stafford District Cricket Club, had your okay. college limited. So yeah. if, uh, Thanks. if Thanks. Councillor Hammond had taken the opportunity further, further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to speak on hopefully all items in the ENC report, and I just ask that uh, items uh, D and E are taken seriatim, and items F and G are taken seriatim. Okay, so D and E together, F and G together. No, no, they were already, I think, but I'm asking that D and E, um, which I think were together, are separated. Yep. Um, and that um, F and G are taken seriatim um, yep. individually as well. Okay, I understand. Please yep. continue. Yeah, so I think that leaves A, B and C together. Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, look, uh, just briefly on item A, I certainly wish the, the new um, club over there good luck. I have a bit of concern about the scale of this, given that um, this type of model um, has not been effective um, in our community for some um, years. I, I know everybody enters into these um, arrangements with the best of intentions, but there's a huge financial commitment a not-for-profit group is taking on here, um, you know, with a big loan and um, a big investment. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know any group in my ward where a restaurant slash club and poker machine models working to sustain the group any longer. Um, so, look, I, I appreciate that they have the absolutely best intentions for sport in our community, um, but I hope that, um, you know, 20 years down the track or even 10 years down the track, we're not dealing with a problem here. Um, to me, 20 years seems um, like a, a bit long, um, but I wish them luck and I understand they have the best intentions. With respect to the lease of council land to community organisations, there is a change in process here which I do not support. When this was brought to my attention a few weeks ago, I wrote back to Council um, uh, seeking to clarify what was being proposed. Um, the change is that we are going to be told um, that the leases are going to be renewed. Um, uh, we know that um, this Council had been improperly disposing of land um, for many years and was uh, caught out during some sort of audit. Uh, and the Lord Mayor changed the process back to our statutory commitment. Um, that meant that all of the internal work that needs to be done before a lease renewal occurs, consultation with internal stakeholders, consultation with external stakeholders, consultation with us as councillors, is done, and then the lease comes up here to council for endorsement. Now, that is a process that I support. Um, I believe that is the right way to go about it. You do your due, 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 I'm sorry, you do your due diligence first, um, and then you approve the lease. The arrangements that are being put in place today turn that around. So this council will sign off on a lease renewal before any due diligence is undertaken. All of the due diligence will occur after this council has signed off on the lease renewal. Um, this means that if, say, we as councillors um, have a concern about how something is running, um, it basically will be blowing in the wind because uh, the decision's already been made by council to renew the lease and it will be delegated off to a council officer to do. And as this chamber knows, um, I've strongly opposed um, the delegation of uh, council decision making uh, to officers. So I do not support um, what is happening here. Um, I believe it is back to front. 
Um, I am concerned um, that it will mean um, that uh, there will be leases where there may be problems, but it's already been endorsed by council. So I just say the proper way to do this is the way we've been doing it for the past almost year, which is to ensure um, that the due diligence is done first, um, that everyone is consulted in the process, and then the lease um, is brought up to full council for uh, decision. And, and in my view, absolutely, that is the way that it should be done. With respect to item C, um, I'll just say that um, it sticks out like a sore thumb in the contracts. There's a $3.6 million contract for something called Master Media Advertising Services. Um, I'm not, I, I would have thought that's over the delegation limit for contracts and tendering myself, but, so I'm, I'm not sure why we're just ticking off on it given the decision's already been made rather than it being approved by council. Um, but the big problem here is, I mean, I asked the Lord Mayor for information about what this is and he did not provide it. Um, so this contract um, is for more media services, more marketing services presumably, um, and it's valued at $3.6 million. Master Media Advertising Services. So, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is. I, 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 it's a simple question. I mean, we come into this place, um, the rules say that if you need clarity around any decision being brought to council, you can stand up and request that information. Now, I've done that and it's not been provided by the Lord Mayor. Not unsurprisingly, it's about media contracts and it's about media services and it is about $3.6 million of council ratepayers' funds um, that this council is going to apply. I don't know, is it to promote the Lord Mayor? Is it uh, to promote council in the community? Is it to do the Great Outdoors Channel 7 TV advertising? Is it, is it for living in Brisbane? I don't know. Hence my question, which was put out there in good faith in seeking an answer, but I did not get one. Um, so, into a vacuum, you can only presume that this is, um, I don't know, rigging the council election outcome by applying $3.6 million um, um, to... Councillor Johnson, we went over this oh, earlier in the day. Did we? Um, please know. use more circumspect and proportionate language, uh, and that was, this was discussed at length. Please do not use those terms. I uh, have asked all councillors to not describe things in that manner. Thank right, you. Okay, so I don't even finish my sentence, and I'm told I can't say it. But the Lord Mayor said it what five times, I believe. So let's. And be I clear. corrected him as well. I Please thought, continue. Well, only after being, you know, pushed. So let's be clear, and it's all on the record. So let's be clear. Um, I had a, I have a question about what 3.6 million dollars in master media advertising services is for, and that question has not been answered by the LNP. Um, uh, uh, on, I'm concerned about the um, Kangaroo Point neighbourhood plan, but I'll defer to the local councillor and listen to his views on this. Um, with respect to the integrated mass transit contract, that's our bus contract with the state government, um, this is probably, I, I think it might be the biggest contract we enter into, like for ongoing service delivery. And I'm, for those listening at home, not allowed to tell you how much it's for because it's commercial in confidence. God help us that you know the ratepayers and the taxpayers of Queensland might actually know how much the bus contract costs. That would be terrible, wouldn't it? Um, so I can't mention it, but it's a huge, huge sum of money. Um, we've got less than half a page of information about this. Um, now, it kind of implies in this that we have to do it or bus service is going to stop at the end of the month, which is a bit of a worry. Um, so I don't know what's gone on here, but... Um, uh, it would not be advisable for Council to operate bus services beyond 24 June 2019 without a service contract with TransLink. So I just say you're cutting it a little bit fine, I would have thought, given it's what the 12th or the 11th of June today. So I just think that we should have some more information about these things that are on the public record um, so that uh, everyone in Brisbane can understand the arrangements. Finally, with respect to item G, I just do not support this. Um, uh, Fast-tracking development um, uh, approvals um, can only lead to mistakes and problems. Um, I absolutely, under no circumstances, support this. 
Um, this council has increasingly over the past few years um, introduced multiple new categories of planning and assessment um, where character homes are waved through in a matter of days and they're modern. No one is looking at the character code or the design. Now, when it comes to drainage and plumbing, if you get that wrong, it can have very serious um, consequences. Council is intending to reduce um, the approval or oversighting down to two days. Now, there's no way they can do that. Maybe the Lord Mayor is going to stand up tomorrow and say there's going to be 50 new plumbing um, uh, officers in council, but I can tell you I don't think there will be. And I know the plumbing officers that are there now, and I know how many complaints come through my office about illegally or improperly connected drainage. This is a massive, massive mistake, and I do not support it. We should be, be, we should be conducting independent checks of drainage approvals. And I know that this says that they're low risk. They are not low risk when you have flooded homes. They are not low risk when you have um, plumbing improperly connected to old grey water lines. They are not low risk when they flood neighbours. They are not low risk um, when they cause sinkholes and cause land to collapse. Um, we have massive problems with our um, drainage network in Brisbane um, in the way that the old scheme was disconnected and not properly disconnected. Um, and the new scheme now is going to have even less oversight um, from Brisbane City Council. Two days is simply you get your form in, you get it paid, you get a tick and it goes out. Um, so I'm extremely concerned about this. I will not support it. I'll be calling for a division. Um, and I, I do not want to see any future homeowner impacted um, by fast-tracking something that should be carefully checked before it is approved by, councillor, uh, by council and before councillor it is Johnson, signed off. Councillor Johnson, your time has expired. Further speakers? Councillor Maddock. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak in regards to item B in the comments uh, in regards to the lease of council land and community organisations. And I also wanted to provide some clarity to uh, the chamber based on the uh, comments that Councillor Johnston had just made uh, in, in regards to leases being uh, approved in this chamber before then going to consultation. Um, we have undertaken a new process, uh, Mr Chair, which I spoke about in this chamber previously. Uh, and for me, uh, and being able to speak on this point is simply also as a clarification to Councillor Johnston. Uh, this point was raised uh, by her in email to the officers in regards uh, to the leases uh, within her own ward, and a, uh, an email will be going to her shortly. Uh, but I just wanted to clarify for her and for all the councillors in this chamber that um, we are not approving the leases, uh, Mr Chair, in the chamber today, and that uh, all councillors will have the full ability to be able to make, uh, to provide feedback, and their feedback will be very much sought in regards to the formal negotiations of the lease and the terms. What we are doing today, Mr Chairman, is as part of a process to expedite applications, where councillors have previously in this chamber noted that uh, it has taken a significant amount of time for uh, leases to be conducted, uh, to be done, uh, this new process will actually streamline that quite uh, significantly. In order to be able to do that, there is a two-step process that was previously done as a single process. And that two-step process, firstly, is to seek the exemption under the City of Brisbane regulations so that we can continue to negotiate directly with the existing lessees. Uh, which we've always done previously, rather than go to market, we've given the existing lessee the opportunity to do that. The documentation before us and the leases that are before us today are simply that uh, in the chamber for the simple process of seeking that exemption. Once that exemption is then ratified by this chamber, Mr Chair, uh, then officers will undertake the necessary processes of the negotiation with the existing lease owners and will be seeking um, councillors' uh, feedback in regards to terms, conditions, uh, and other related matters in regards to that lease. What previously happened was that all both of those steps were then undertaken and a file was created for each lease brought to this chamber uh, and councillors had the opportunity, if they so choose, uh, chose to, to review it and then they had the opportunity at that point to either support or not support. But it took a significant period of time for that to occur and so it was the exemption plus the negotiation. We've now broken that into two in order to reduce what would normally be a year process down to five or six months. So today is simply about the exemption, which was sought and continues to be sought in the ordinary course uh, under law, uh, and all councillors will then follow through in the ordinary process. The leases that we have here today 
uh, are an, a clear example of this administration's strong commitment to supporting our community organisations and making sure that those that are already on site and wish to continue that relationship have the ability to do so. And, and that once we get past this initial stage, the conversation with the uh, particular clubs around terms and other such conditions or even uh, sub lessees or licences that may or will currently be uh, in place will then also be part of that uh, negotiation. This is uh, an important process. It is one that is done efficiently by officers and thoroughly in order that the, uh, that the leases reflect the needs of the club. And the councillor, as always, continues to play a pivotal role in support of their organisation and providing uh, further feedback or insight uh, that officers uh, would always look forward uh, to because of the close relationship that all councillors have with their clubs. So I certainly um, um, call on all councillors to support this. This is just a streamlining and a continuation of what we have always done. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item A and also on item E, the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan. Um, just firstly on item A, the, the lease to the Crushers Leagues Club. Um, I've said this in, a part, in the past and I'll say this again. I think it is disgusting and shameful that this council continues to lease out public facilities to operators that use poker machines. I think all councillors in this place need to reflect deeply on the damage that poker machines are doing in our community and what scope there is within our power to challenge and, and change that. I acknowledge that to some extent the decision around which club to give a facility to might be considered separate from whether or not poker machines are a good thing, but this is something that we do have control over. We as councillors can make decisions about what, sort, what sorts of groups gain access to subsidised council facilities and, and have some influence over where poker machines appear in our communities. I don't need to quote all the statistics for you. I'm sure most of the councillors in this chamber are well aware of the damage that poker machines do, are well aware of the negative social and economic impacts of problem gambling, and understand the fact that the, the, money, the money that might flow back into the community in terms of infrastructure upgrades or subsidised services does not offset the massive cost and the massive harm that problem gambling and poker machines do in our society. And we have a choice. We have a choice here. And I'm, I'm proud of the fact that none of the community facilities in my ward um, use poker machines. The, the soccer clubs and the footy clubs work really, really hard to remain viable. And particularly, I congratulate South Leagues Club um, and East Soccer Club for, for not using poker machines. And they do that because they have the support of the community and the support of the local councillor to follow other business models. Point of order, Matt, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Cummins, point of order to you, Councillor Councillor Shree, take a question. Sure. Councillor Shree, would you take a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, Councillor Shree, aware that East uh, Soccer Club uh, receives a substantial grant every year from a gaming machine club in Kessels Road, Mount Gravatt, I think it's Southside Community Club, and which provides generous financial support, ma mainly raised from Councillor Cummings, it's gaming, more questions, uh, it's a statement, please. to East Soccer Club. Uh, yeah, in, you know, in future, please keep questions to questions and not statements masquerading as questions. Sorry, no, I wasn't aware of that, uh, but I'll happily Councillor chat Shree. to you about that further because that's, that's very interesting to me. Thank you. Um, I, I won't harp on about it, but I. I just really do think we should be setting a, a clear, sending a clear message to the community that we don't want poker machines in our neighbourhoods and that for those facilities that we do have control over, we say no. It's, it's quite simple to me. Um, turning to the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan, I have a number of concerns about this, but I think the broad, broader overarching concern is that this neighbourhood planning process is not actually a holistic neighbourhood plan. And I think when, when I talk to councillors from other councils around Australia, they're surprised at how limited the scope is of the neighbourhood planning process that Brisbane City Council undertakes. It would be better described as, a, as an upzoning plan or a rezoning plan rather than a holistic neighbourhood plan. I say that because it doesn't include a, a proper transport plan for, that, for the area in question. It doesn't have a, a, a plan around supporting local commerce or local business. It, it simply acts to upzone or change the zoning of private land uses, but does not include funding for necessary infrastructure and community facilities. So the plan says a whole bunch of great stuff about, oh, there's a footbridge and we're completing the river walk and this will happen and that will happen. But there's no money attached to any of those commitments. 
And what we've seen with other neighbourhood plans in my ward is that the, the infrastructure that is promised to cater for population growth never comes. The, the South Brisbane Riverside Neighbourhood Plan, which was drafted back in 2010, approved in 2011, promised a, a city cat terminal at Victoria Street to cater for that population growth and upzoning, and that still hasn't been delivered by this council. So the problem here is that we are upzoning and increasing the density of neighbourhoods around Brisbane, but not delivering the infrastructure and services to match. And that's really concerning. And, and I, I know that the Lord Mayor was a bit clever with his words. He tried to mask the fact that he, I think he said something along the lines of um, no new sites have been added to the high, high density zoning. And that's technically correct. But the height limits on many sites that are already within that high density zoning are still being increased. So while at first glance it might not seem like there's a lot of upzoning going on, in actual fact this council is upzoning to allow significantly increased density. And as I've mentioned before, there's no funding for community facilities, there's no funding for public infrastructure, and most concerningly, there's no new land identified for public parkland. So you're cramming thousands of additional residents into an area where they won't have backyards, where they won't have much private green space, but you're also not giving them any more public green space. And, and I think that's a real failing on the part of this council. The other big concern I have is um, around retrospectively legitimising dodgy approvals. So, for example, the site at 26 Can Street, which under the previous neighbourhood plan had a height limit of three storeys, was recently approved by this council with a development for upwards of 15 storeys. Yeah. So the, the council didn't even comply with its own existing neighbourhood plan. And now the new plan that's come in has magically that site's been upzoned to 15 storeys to, to legitimise that previous approval. And I encourage councillors, if they're interested, to check that out. I've raised it in this debate several times in the past, where a deliberate decision was made by this council to say, yeah, we know that the neighbourhood plan says three storeys for that site, but so what? We're going to allow these two high-rises there anyway because we think that's a better fit. And then later it comes through and says, oh, yeah, well, that used to say three storeys, but now we've approved these big towers. We might as well change the, plan, the, the zoning retrospectively. That's a very poor process. That's a very poor process. And uh, Councillor Burke, I can hear your interjections. You, you can check the record. That site was clearly identified under the neighbourhood plan for three storeys and open space, and council approved it for two towers. So I'm, I welcome the debate if you want it. But um, the, the other concern I have is around the, the fact that um, although the city frame is being expanded, and I, I think that's a positive, and I congratulate um, the administration for that, we're still requiring developers or forcing developers to provide more off-street parking than the market demands. So in that part of Kangaroo Point, the street parking is already maxed out. A lot of, a lot of it is metered parking. So if, if you don't provide off-street parking, that doesn't necessarily force lots of cars onto the street. It just means that people do, can't own as many cars because there's literally nowhere left in the peninsula. It's quite a distinct situation from out in the suburbs. But what council is doing is still forcing developers to provide certain minimums of car parking, even where the developers are saying, well, actually, this, this site is right next to a free ferry. It's going to have a walk, walking bridge directly to the CBD. The people who live in this part of the peninsula don't necessarily want to own multiple cars in the future. Yet we are forcing the market, we are forcing private developers to deliver something which drives up the costs of construction. Those costs are passed on to the buyers but actually doesn't meet the needs of the local community. So I think greater flexibility around those parking requirements would have been a lot better to see. Other lost opportunities in this plan include the fact that we haven't fully addressed the concern around short-term accommodation, where apartments which are supposed to be used as rental accommodation or owner-occupier accommodation for long-term residents instead get converted into de facto hotels. And this is something that I hope both Liberal councillors and Labor Party councillors will take note of because it's a growing trend in our city where instead of renting out apartments to local residents, developers and investors are renting them out via Airbnb or other short-term hotel booking sites with the result that all this increased density, we, we're actually just getting more hotel rooms disguised as residential apartments. That, all, that has a negative flow-on impact of driving some of the existing motel operators out of business, but it also means that we're not actually meeting the, the need for housing in the city. So we have what should have been a, a residential apartment might be rented out one or two nights a week and then sitting empty four or five or six nights a week. 
and Council has mechanisms available to address this, but so far in, in this plan and more generally in the city doesn't seem to have done a particularly good job of addressing that concern. I also have the same old concerns about the fact that we're missing opportunities to provide public housing or community housing as part of these neighbourhood plans. I'm not satisfied by the excuses that, oh, that that's the state government issue. There's, there are many mechanisms available to introduce forms of inclusion rezoning via local land use planning changes, and I, I think this council hasn't s seriously and sincerely explored those options. Um, and I guess I, overall, I'm, I'm concerned that our, our densification strategy here is in, encouraging and concentrating development in areas that are already more than dense enough and paradoxically is undermining the potential for development to occur in other parts of the city where it's really needed. So for example, there are parts of Kangaroo Point that are already five and six storey apartments where those apartments are now being demolished and replaced with even taller buildings. Now it would make more sense to pre preserve those five and six storey apartment blocks and encourage development to be spread around a bit more in other parts even of the Gabba Ward. But instead we're, we're essentially creating a situation where some pockets are so densely populated and so underserved by public parkland and community facilities that it's having a material and significant negative impact on people's quality of life, while other areas remain neglected, while we see vacant lots proliferating, while we see investors sitting on sites and not doing anything with them. So the whole strategy of land use rezoning is failing. Finally, I have one positive piece of feedback, which mm -hmm. is Councilor that I'm Shred, very uh, grateful your for. Your time has expired. Oh, well. Further speakers? Councillor Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I rise to speak on items C and D. Um, in terms of item C, I'll quickly touch upon contract 22, which has created a bit of debate this afternoon. Um, the contract with Zenith Media is to communicate with the residents of Brisbane. We have a very, very significant range of projects currently underway, those currently in planning, and obviously Metro springs to mind, and uh, in future, obviously, initiatives such as the Green Bridges and the Victoria Park Vision. So we have an obligation as a council to communicate with our 1.1 million residents. The contract in question allows us to uh, place media, place advertisements in appropriate publications, and it includes the communication of things such as um, neighbourhood planning advertisements upon which we have a, a requirement to communicate with our communities. It also includes advertisements for programs such as Love, Food, Hate, Waste. If you pick up a local newspaper at any month and have a look through the kind of things we're trying to communicate to the wider Brisbane community, you'll get some good insights into what that money spent. And while there's been a lot of um, debate around the size of the, uh, the contract, the uh, particular contract that we're looking at today is for $476,000 to communicate with 1.1 million residents. That's 50 cents per resident. Anyone want to guess how much it costs to buy a packet of chewing gum? $2. So 50 cents to communicate with our community. That is not a lot of money. You need to put this into perspective, I think, accordingly. I've never had anybody come to my ward office and say, Councillor Allen, I'm getting too much information. Yeah. <laughs> what they say to me is, this is great, love what you're doing, keep me informed. The only people who seem to be complaining about it are sitting over here. They're not coming into my ward office. So enough for uh, item 22. While we were debating that, I thought a far more important contract was the next one, contract 23 which is a um, short-term professional counselling service for our staff. Now, this is to council staff where they've had some sort of a traumatic incident, potentially. Um, I've had first-hand uh, knowledge of a, uh, a member of the community, not a staff member, who was a witness and involved as a first responder in a motor vehicle accident. So I can appreciate how traumatic these events can be. And the fact that our council is providing these types of services to support our staff I think is really important and potentially a lot more important than contract 22 which created so much debate. Um, moving on to the audit committee report, obviously council has a, an obligation under the City of Brisbane regulations to, uh, to have an audit committee and that audit committee reviews the internal audit report and 
other operational risk reports that come before it at each of its meetings. At these meetings, the CEO, CFO and others present, as they have in this particular instance, about different aspects of their um, operational uh, purview. The particular point that Councillor Cumming raised uh, around the Ward Parks and Footpaths Trust Fund was simply that um, at a point in time, the state government, in their uh, attempts to uh, potentially uh, influence uh, elections, were looking at discretionary spending uh, obligations and obviously um, you know, we needed to understand what that was about and uh, that was uh, addressed at that point. In terms of the abusive and aggressive behaviour um, which Councillor Cumming raised, look, uh, sadly, we are getting more of this. Um, we are seeing people in our um, uh, council facilities, whether it's our libraries or our regional offices, where they're coming in and they're potentially um, under the influence of, of alcohol or drugs, and they are aggressive, um, that does create a security concern for us. We need to coach and train our staff members to be uh, able to, to respond to these situations and obviously have in place um, the appropriate hardware and services that we need to manage these situations, such as CCTV. So um, it is a, a, a reality, it is unfortunate. And in fact, in my ward just recently at, uh, at Nunda Library, uh, there was a fairly significant case of um, uh, vandalism where all of the outdoor furniture was destroyed one evening. So you know, we are seeing this, it's an unfortunate reality uh, of our society. And from a council perspective, and. Uh, in the interests of managing our risks, we need to be aware of it. We need to consider um, how regular the incidences are and also have appropriate plans for our staff to be able to respond. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Richards. Uh, Mr Chair, I move that Council now adjourn for afternoon tea for 15 minutes, which commences only when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richard, seconded by Councillor Mark. So this council now adjourned for a period of 15 minutes for the purposes of afternoon tea, commencing when all councillors have vacated the chamber and the doors have been locked. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it.
Claire Adams. Thank you, Mr Chair. I rise today to speak on item F, the integrated mass transit service contract. This item today seeks Council's approval to enter into a new contract with TransLink, finally, for Brisbane's bus services. We have been working with TransLink for a number of years now on renewing the existing contract. And as the Lord Mayor said earlier, not a whole lot of changes. We were hoping for a 4G. We've got 3G renewed plus, plus 3G, 3G plus. renewed. Um, and uh, we have agreed on all the terms of the contract and we just need the signing off this afternoon to enter into this. So this is, wasn't something that was happened at the last minute, as was mentioned by other councillors, leaving it till the very last minute before the contract fell over at the end of, the, of this month. This is something that has been in the pipeline since, I'm going to say 2013, we started the extension of the 3G. It's been many, many years we've been working through this. Um, always working with TransLink in line to make sure that the start of the, uh, the contract was ready for the end of the extension, as the case may have been. The contract will be for three years, with the option to extend for a further year. Um, and some new inclusions are said mainly the same, but there's some new inclusions when it comes to reporting and key performance indicators. As part of the contract, TransLink will be funding the installation of the telematics system that the Lord Mayor mentioned on all of our buses, and they'll cover the costings for those. So we'll be able to get some reliable and fast intel about how the bus is travelling in terms of on-time running and performance matters. And they are some of the new components of the contract to ensure that Council does deliver a better bus service year on year. We can learn from our past experiences and make them better in the future. Things like missed trips, on-time running, customer experience that can be surveyed, customer safety, particularly when we're looking about vehicle specifications, uh, approved vehicles on routes and major defects, uh, reporting, so fair revenue collection, revenue reporting, incident and network reports, and attendance at critical meetings as well. The contract also, very importantly, includes both the City Loop and the City Glider services, which are currently managed by a separate agreement, but they are now coming all under the one roof of this contract that we have here today. In terms of revenue for bus wraps, we have an agreed figure with TransLink around how much they receive from us, which is $2.3 million annually. This has been agreed no matter how much revenue Council receives from bus advertising. Can I uh, congratulate the officers on many, many years' hard work um, and TransLink as well to coming to a mutual agreement um, so that we can ensure Brisbane residents can get home quicker and safer on Australia's most modern bus fleet. Thank you, Thank Mr you. Chair. Further speakers? Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Mr Chair. I'm going to uh, speak on item E, Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan, uh, and briefly on uh, this contract uh, for integrated mass transit service uh, item F. Now, I'll just start briefly on that. And we, as the Leader of the Opposition has said, we of course support this contract. Uh, and uh, um, clearly, um, this side of the chamber has a great track record when it comes to uh, providing public transport services uh, to the people of Brisbane. Uh, and we're very interested in the details of this uh, ongoing contract negotiation. It's something I've regularly asked about in the Public and Active Transport Committee over the last couple of years. Uh, it's something that we should all be very interested in uh, when we know that uh, the value of this contract is $328 million, including base contract fee and other contributions, uh, depending on the type of service fee recalculated annually based on mixture of methodologies, i.e. consumer price index wage price index or actuals. So that's a pretty serious contract. I'm talking $328 million per annum, and we're given one and a half pages yeah. of information. Yeah. The half page, so on the, on the one page of information, there are some dot points and single lines at each point. And on the half page of information, most of that is blocked blanked out for commercial inconfidence. So the only figure we see on the second page is the 50 per cent of net service costs of Blue City Glider, $5.244 million, and the 50 per cent cost extension Langlands Park Cooper Square for the Maroon City Glider, $74,647. So as a council, that is uh, 
you know, charged by the people of Brisbane to make decisions on their behalf as elected representatives, entering into a contract, authority to enter into this contract with TransLink, worth $328 million a year. A little more information uh, would go a long way to, do, to dispelling um, the strongly held view out in the community uh, that this council is not really all that open and transparent when it comes to information and particularly uh, these kind of big financial contracts that uh, this council is entering into. But we will, of course, support uh, the provision of bus services in this city. On item E, the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan. Last time this came uh, to the chamber, Labor supported it going out for consultation but raised uh, a whole series of concerns um, around that. And I share some of those concerns that Councillor Sri, the local councillor, um, has raised in the debate, Mr Chair, um, particularly around the provision of infrastructure to accompany the increase uh, in housing density and the increase in population growth uh, in this peninsula. So yes, uh, population growth in this city is requiring uh, council to look at where people are going to live and plan for that. Um, and clearly, the um, Kangaroo Point area is an area that can accommodate uh, that growth. So what we're seeing, as Councillor Sri said, uh, some of those uh, zones and some of those areas and particular properties within them um, have seen significant upzoning. So we'll now see 20-storey towers uh, in parts of the Kangaroo uh, Point Peninsula. But what is lacking from this council and this administration is the clear provision um, uh, of that infrastructure that needs to go with a growing community like this, and particularly around things like uh, walkability around this peninsula. Now, we heard from the Lord Mayor about the provisions for planning for um, the Kangaroo Point uh, Active Transport Bridge, which Labor proposed at the last election. Uh, so we know there is you know, talk of this, but when it comes to connecting uh, these other areas that will be developed significantly over the coming years, uh, there is a failure to plan for that. The other concerning thing in this neighbourhood plan, as in some others we've seen come through this place, is the lack of clearly defined acceptable outcomes in so many um, uh, different aspects of the neighbourhood plan. So, yes, we are operating in a performance-based planning system uh, set out under the Planning Act. Uh, and there have to be performance outcomes that are listed so uh, we can assess against them. But all too often, this administration relies entirely on the performance outcomes and doesn't prescribe any acceptable outcomes whatsoever. So when it comes to things like the views of the iconic story bridge, uh, no acceptable outcome pres prescribed, just a, a vague performance outcome. When it comes to developing of supermarkets, no acceptable outcome, just vague performance outcomes. Again, another one uh, on views. Development, this is the performance outcome, development preserve views to and from the Story Bridge. Um, but there are no acceptable outcomes when it comes to developments that will actually uh, cause um, buildings to be built in those views. When it comes to large scale uh, developments of things like hardware stores, trade supply stores, showrooms, things like that, uh, particularly in the main street precinct of the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan, no acceptable outcome uh, is prescribed, just a vague performance outcome. When it comes to pedestrian connections, once again, between Main Street and the bridge undercroft area, Main Street to Story Bridge Deck and undercarriage, uh, and the bridge undercroft area between Balladon Street and Holman Street, no acceptable outcome is prescribed. In the Thornton Street precinct, uh, where it comes to the development uh, of and around heritage and preserving the heritage and landscape qualities uh, of some of those historic buildings there, surprise, surprise, no acceptable outcome is prescribed, just vague performance outcomes. And Mr Chair, this goes on and on, where it comes to pedestrian connections, uh, the connections to the proposed bridge, open spaces and walkability, and non-residential uses uh, as well, AO12, AO13, AO14, AO15, AO16, all no acceptable outcome is prescribed. So, this administration's approach to planning is very clear, it has been for some time, that it's Rafferty's rules for developers when it comes to complying uh, with acceptable or performance outcomes, because the, the preference of the administration is that 
In neighbourhood plans, it should be dealing with the fine grain planning of a community. There is no requirement to stick to that, uh, that neighbourhood plan based on what we would hope was feedback from the local community. Uh, it is just relying on dozens and dozens of vague performance outcomes. And we don't think that's good enough uh, for this community and isn't in line with, uh, uh, with you know, the, the administration's much vaunted planning blueprint uh, and the exercise that local residents in the uh, Kangaroo Point Peninsula area went into uh, uh, in good faith. So we won't be supporting uh, the Kangaroo Point Peninsula Neighbourhood Plan. Further speakers? Councillor Burke. Thanks very much, uh, Mr Chairman. I just rise to uh, enter the debate on E, very briefly on F, and then on item uh, G, Mr Chairman. And I'll start with item F because Councillor Cassie, I wasn't going to talk on this, but Councillor Cassie made this wonderful statement that, that his side of the chamber, that this side of the chamber, uh, has a proud track record when it comes to delivering public transport. Um, well, I don't know what history you're trying to recreate, Councillor Cassidy, but uh, I remember public transport under the Australian Labor Party in this place. I remember uh, the media articles about buses that didn't have back doors. I remember the media articles of bus about buses that caught fire. I remember the media articles about buses. I remember catching buses as a school child uh, when Jim Sawley was the Lord Mayor in this place that didn't have air conditioning, um, that weren't environmentally friendly. Uh, and I also remember the track record of the Australian Labor Party when it actually comes to buying buses in this place, uh, Mr Chairman, where in one five-year period they bought the grand total of 63 buses. One five-year period they bought 63 buses. 63 buses. Like, honestly, Mr Chairman, through the gall, the gall of Councillor Cassidy, the bluff and bluster, uh, the creative reinventing of history that he tries to do in this place, Mr Chairman, when it comes to public transport and a range of other issues. It just must, must eat away at the Labor councillors in this place that this administration has been the best friend when it comes to the environment in this city. It's been the best friend when it comes to public and active transport in this city, whether it is buses, whether it is cycleways, whether it's our investment in ferries and city cats, uh, Mr Chairman, it must eat away at them. It just must eat away at them at night. Uh, to see that this side of the chamber is actually doing the things that the Labor Party likes to talk about, as opposed to just talking about doing them. So turning to item uh, G and item E, Mr Chairman, uh, I'll deal with item uh, G first. So this is the uh, Plumbing and Drainage Act fast track permits work. Um, Councillor Johnston spent a fair bit of time talking about um, her lack of support for this item. We also did get a little bit of a lecture about not complying with laws potentially ourselves, uh, and then Councillor Johnson encouraged Council not to comply with the state government's laws when it comes to the Plumbing and Drainage Act. Um, these are not changes that Council Point of has. order. Point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Claim to be misrepresented. Noted. Um, these are not changes that Council has created by itself. These are changes in the State Government Act we are bound to implement the changes that the state government have put forward. They have said you must change the time you give permits out in from 10 days to two days. It is not council going, hey, it would be great to change the time and lower the, the time and get a quicker turnaround for people from 10 days to two days. It is the state government. It is a requirement of us to implement these changes. So as much as Councillor Johnson might like to arc up about this. If we don't implement these changes, uh, we would be in conflict with the provisions that the state government have put into their act and into their regulations, Mr Chairman. And so we are going about uh, the work that we have to do to make sure that we are complying with those state government regulations. Uh, what type of works is being undertaken? So drain sealing off, um, so sealing an existing sanitary drain will be a two-day turnaround. Drain, excuse me, drain reconnection, so connecting an existing sanitary drain to a new connection point would be a two-day turnaround. Drain, drain works, repairing an existing sanitary drain. Other repairing to existing water service works. Uh, plumbed in rainwater tanks uh, and prefabricated pods for off-site uh, plumbing units, including laundries, bathrooms and kitchens. These are the sort of things uh, that the state government has said to councils, not just Brisbane, but councils across uh, the state you must now change your regulations and you must provide a response back within two days uh, on, these, um, uh, on these outcomes. So 
Uh, I hope that all councillors can support that this afternoon uh, and sh show their support for making sure council is in compliance with the state government laws and regulations. Uh, just turning to um, the neighbourhood plan that we have uh, before us, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, we have uh, obviously gone out for public consultation on the Kangaroo Point neighbourhood plan. Uh, there were 75 submission or 77 submissions uh, that came in as part of that consultation, and Council has undertaken uh, its due diligence uh, to review those, uh, to make changes where appropriate. As the Lord Mayor said, this is one of the oldest neighbourhood plans. Uh, it dates back to 1990, uh, Mr Chairman, uh, and there has been considerable changes in Kangaroo Point uh, between in those 28 uh, interceding uh, years, Mr Chairman. I did listen with some interest, though, to Councillor uh, Shree, who uh, made a number of comments about this particular plan um, and that he doesn't like the density that is going to be seen in Kangaroo Point. And this, I guess, is part of an ongoing, con uh, uh, ongoing um, conversation that Councillor Shree has had and the Labor, Party's, Labor Party also has uh, in this place, where um, there doesn't seem to be an appropriate place to put density in the city. So we've had them, we've had, we've had them, we've had them uh, out against greenfield development. So greenfield development was out, Mr. Chairman, when we debated uh, the developments up at um, uh, Capera, up in Councillor Toomey's ward. Uh, infield development is out, Mr. Chairman, because the Labor councillors want us to get rid of character two, so you can't build uh, some townhouses in and around uh, some of those well-serviced parts of the city. High rises development, out, is, development is out, Mr. Chairman, because Councillor Shree doesn't want people living in Kangaroo Point or in West End uh, in high-rise buildings. So where? I mean, this is the real challenge and the real question for Councillor Shree and the Labor Party in this place, is where do the people who are coming to the city of Brisbane who want to work here, who want to have jobs, who want to enjoy our lifestyle, enjoy the climate and enjoy everything that this great city has to offer, where are they going to live? Are you going to force them to live out at Logan and Ipswich? Because that would go against your mantra of trying to create easier lifestyles for people and less impact through carbon, carbon emissions and not having to drive, where are they going to live? If Kangaroo Point is not an ideal location in the city to put density, then I don't know where is, Mr Chairman. It is well serviced by public transport. There is buses. There is uh, point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor Shree. Will Councillor Burke take a question? I've got a lot of material to cover here, Mr Councilor Chairman. Councillor Burke, will you take a question? I've got a lot of material to cover. I'm sorry, Mr no, Chairman. No, he's declining, Councillor Shree. As I say, there is three ferry terminals that service this peninsula as well. There is a new footbridge that this Lord Mayor is committed to that will provide access and connection straight over to the City Botanic Gardens and link into the CBD, Mr Chairman, and through nature of its location, be able for residents to then link straight across the Goodwill Bridge over to South Bank. This is a location where our city can support increases in density, just as the CBD and parts of the city frame can also support those increases in density. You know why we go about this process through the neighbourhood planning process, and this is where the density is going in our city? Because that's what the residents of Brisbane told us, Mr Chairman. When we did the city shape process back in 2006, the residents of Brisbane said, we want the density in the CBD and the frame and along the transport corridors. When we did Brisbane's Future Blueprint, the residents reinforced those views, Mr Chairman. And that's why we've been going about the process of implementing neighbourhood plans across this city and facilitating that feedback from the residents of Brisbane. So when Councillor Shree stands up and goes, oh, I don't think this is great, I don't think he's gone out there and talked to all the residents across the whole of the city and gone, where do you think density should go in the city of Brisbane, Mr Chairman? We've undertaken those processes three times, city plan, city shape, and plan your Brisbane. And residents have clearly said that these are the sort of areas which can support growth and support density in our city. Uh, we've taken on board residents, fe the residents' feedback around heritage issues uh, and removing one of the buildings at the old travel lodge site, Mr Chairman, from its heritage protection. We've removed some of the high density zoning uh, that was around the Story Bridge, Mr Chairman. Uh, we've also put in greater controls on significant landscape trees as well. So what we've done is we've listened to the residents. Councillor Cassidy, though, took quite a bit of time at the end of his speech uh, to have a crack about performance outcomes versus acceptable outcomes. Now, I actually had a little question with the council officers earlier uh, today about the temporary local planning instrument. Because if you read the temporary local planning instrument that we have before us today, uh, Mr Chairman, there is no acceptable outcome prescribed in the temporary local planning instrument either. 
And there's a very good reason for that, because there is no acceptable outcome other than the one that we have already said in that temporary local planning instrument. And the same goes for the items that Councillor Cassidy raised in the neighbourhood plan that's before us today. But, and there's a but, because of the state government's performance-based planning scheme, we cannot write an amendment to the city plan that does not have a performance outcome. We are technically bound to provide a performance outcome. And that is why we have said there is a performance outcome that sits next to that acceptable outcome. We have to assess the applications that come in, Mr Chairman, against those performance outcomes, but that does not mean that we have to approve applications, Mr Chairman, that come in that only have the performance outcome where there is no acceptable outcome. So Councillor Cassidy can make this big song and Councillor dance as he Burke, likes your to time do, has expired. But... Uh, there was a mis misrepresentation by Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, uh, Councillor Burke said that I was uh, encouraging uh, council to breach state government legislation. Um, uh, that is completely uh, false. Uh, the, uh, my comments were that I did not support the change from uh, 10 days to two days, and that reflects council's power under paragraph 57 uh, of the report before us today, which indicates that it Johnston. is further speakers. It is a consideration by council. To no, no, no. You don't get to relitigate your argument. In a misrepresentation. Councillor Strunk. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Listen, I rise to speak uh, on item C, uh, C contract and tendering, and uh, want to speak about uh, one, of the, uh, one of the contracts, uh, uh, item uh, contract number 19, which is a amenities block which is being, uh, has been constructed uh, in the uh, Lakes uh, Park precinct. Uh, Parklands precinct. Um, listen, when this uh, amenities block was announced, um, oh, just after the budget last year, um, my, my community was very relieved in more ways than one. Uh, and that is that they uh, have been calling for an amenities block um, at the uh, south, uh, southeastern corner of the, um, uh, of the lake uh, for, for a number of years um, uh, because the, uh, the, the other amenity or amenities blocks uh, are at the uh, far end of the lake uh, up on uh, Forest Lake Boulevard. Uh, which was uh, a considerable distance for families to travel uh, right around the, um, the footpath uh, from Alexandrina Circuit uh, up, to, um, up, to the, uh, up to the boulevard. Um, the, um, a number of uh, community groups, uh, including our, uh, a number of our seniors groups, right, uh, really advocated uh, for this uh, over some years, and um, they were very gratified when, uh, when that announcement was made uh, last year. Um, and I'd just like to uh, read into the um, into the uh, uh, into Hansard the, the, the a couple of names that were really big advocates in this in this in this area. Uh, Dan and Julie Baldwin from the uh, Forest Lake National Seniors, um, Les Brooks, uh, and uh, Lynn uh, uh, Anning uh, from the uh, Six uh, Fifty and Betters, uh, Probus uh, President uh, Barbara Grant. Uh, and uh, Marge Breitenbach from, as I say, from Probus, uh, along with the Forest Lake Action Group as well as a collective. Um, it's really gratifying when, um, when, when someone asks for, for a particular piece of infrastructure um, and then the community gets right behind that. Um, uh, and it's really helpful for, I'm sure, all councillors uh, when you have community groups that will support uh, your request uh, to the Lord Mayor's uh, uh, um, or what we, used to, what we do call as a wish list uh, every year that we put through to inform the budget. Um, I'd just like to um, thank uh, council um, officers uh, for, um, for making sure that this actually happened uh, before the end of the financial year, um, because uh, as I say, it's a very, uh, it was a very important piece of infrastructure for the lake. And I know that that doesn't, uh, and many of these blocks don't happen usually too often or new ones in um, especially parkland uh, that uh, have been established for some number of years. Um, so I just like to uh, say uh, thanks to uh, thanks to the um, thanks to the administration for um, listening to my uh, my constituents, uh, and uh, it's uh, it's something that will be very um, 
uh, it hasn't actually opened yet, uh, but um, we're having a bit of an opening in the next uh, in the next few weeks once the um, once the services are connected and they're up and running. Thank you. Further speakers? There being none, Lord Mayor. Uh, yes, just very briefly uh, on item F, the um, uh, the new contract with TransLink. Um, as usual, we have uh, both um, Labor councillors and uh, independent councillors claiming um, incorrectly that um, there is a lack of information here because of something that council has done. This is not the case. I distinctly remember as the former chairman of this portfolio when our managers in negotiating with TransLink had to, design, had to sign a state government non-disclosure agreement in order to conduct the no negotiations. So they, they were bound legally not to release certain information about contract negotiations. This wasn't our doing, this was the request of the state government. And I remember having a committee presentation where I was trying to ensure that committee members were provided with information on this contract and our managers weren't able to answer the questions because they were bound by a non-disclosure agreement from the state government. Um, I've also asked the question in the past, well, how does our contract compare with the contract that other bus operators in South East Queensland have? No one knows the answer to that because those contracts are secret. Those contracts have not been released by the state government. So I don't have any idea what um, the contract is with um, you know, the bus operators in the surrounding council areas um, and because those contracts have been made secret by the state government. So this is not an issue of what council is not releasing or deciding to release. It is what the state government allows us to release. Now, uh, we have made it very clear in our budget documents uh, what we're investing into public transport, uh, whether it's bus or ferry services and others, uh, other services. The state government provides a total overall figure that they invest, but the breakdown uh, we are not permitted to release by the state government and uh, their own requirements. So I just wanted to point that out very clearly. Uh, this is not us. This is the state government determining what can be released as part of this contract. Thank you. Uh, all right, now um, we'll put items A, B and C. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Item D, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And those against? The ayes have it. Division. Division called Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming. Eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. There we go. <clears throat> Attendants, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 20 in favour and 6 against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Item E, all those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. no. The ayes have it. Division. Division, Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cumming. Uh, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendance, please close the bars. Clerks, please read the result. Mr. Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 19 in favour and 7 against. Uh, the ayes have it, please return to your seats. Items F and G. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And to the Point contrary. of order. I ask for those to be taken seriatim. Oh, excuse me. I thought you said you wanted them together. Item F. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. And item G. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And all those against, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Johnson, Councillor Cumming, eyes to my right, nose to my left. Please ring the bells. Attendants, please close the bars. Uh, clerks, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it, the voting being 24 in favour, one against and one abstention. The ayes have it. Please return to your seats. Uh, councillors, can I draw your attention to the ENC special report of the 10th of June, Lord Mayor? Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the special report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on Monday, 10th of June 2019 be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Lord Mayor, seconded by the Deputy Mayor, that the special report of the Establishment and Coordination Committee meeting held on the 10th of, New of June 2019 be adopted. Is there any debate, Lord Mayor? Uh, yes, uh, Mr Chair, this is a temporary local planning instrument for number 7, 9, 11 and 13 Leopard Street and 10, 14, 16 and 18 Wild Street Kangaroo Point for the property known as Lamb House. Uh, Lamb House has been a state heritage listed property since 1992 and sits on land holdings of uh, at least 3,000 square metres across eight different lots. Uh, Lamb House is also a local heritage place, uh, but the state heritage listing prevails over the local, local heritage listing. As councillors would be aware, the house and the property is a landmark in the Kangaroo Point area, highly visible from several vantage points across the city. The zoning for the property is low, medium density uh, residential and character residential infill. It was zoned low, medium density in the city plan 2000 and also in the 1987 town plan. Whilst there is a state heritage listing on the property and any development application would need to be referred to the state government for their approval, the zoning of the land does enable multiple dwellings and council is aware that a consent caveat has been registered on the property. A caveat, once registered, is a statutory injunction aimed at protecting the interests of someone who is not the registered owner. Uh, so given recent uh, media coverage of this matter, uh, read between the lines here, um, there is another interest in this property other than the owner of the property as registered. We believe that any future proposed development on the site would have a detrimental impact on the landmark nature of the heritage property and on the character, streetscape and the significant fig trees on site. A proposed TLPI, which is before the Chamber today, has been prepared to ensure that the site is protected from any development that may adversely impact on this landmark property, its character and the street streetscape values of the area. Section 23 of the State Government's Planning Act sets out the local government powers to make a TLPI, and it can only be 
uh, put in place with the relevant state government minister's approval. The reasons for the TLPI are spelled out in the agenda item uh, and in the proposed TLPI and correspondence to the minister. Council is also seeking approva uh, approval for an earlier effective date to ensure that Lamb House is given the earliest possible protection. Once the TLPI is adopted by Council and has approval from the Minister, it will have effect for a period of two years or until an amendment to City Plan takes effect that would protect the site. Uh, I have discussed this TLPI uh, with the Deputy Premier, uh, Jackie Trad. Uh, she is aware that it is coming uh, and is supportive of our um, proposal putting this forward. Uh, I understand Councillor Burke has also been in touch with the relevant minister uh, as well on the same issue. Uh, so we appear to have the strong support of the state government in taking this action. As I mentioned before, this action has been triggered by uh, it coming to attention that there is another interest registered on the title of this property. Uh, I commend this proposal to the chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cumming. We support this matter. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on the motion and to thank the administration for um, bringing through this T TLPI. I've obviously been advocating around the concerns of, about this property for quite some time now. Um, I, I think this seems like a positive step forward. I guess I'm a bit cautious, though, that um, it doesn't really address the long-term problem. So what I'd really like to see this administration do is to start advancing those conversations about community uh, taking this land on and taking this site on and for restoration as some kind of community facility. Um, I can imagine the site working quite well as um, a community centre with, uh, for example, a tourism hub and possible uses of the adjoining green space that um, would kind of do, do justice to this important landmark. Um, I'm also, for the record, not entirely close to the idea of a few granny flats in the backyard, but it is quite a constrained site, and I think that um, any significant residential development around the building would undermine the heritage values of the, of the site as a whole. So um, I don't think it's going to be economically viable to develop this site um, on a commercial basis without knocking down the house, and I definitely don't want to see that happen. So I think it's really important that we use whatever mechanisms are available to us to protect the building. But I do just want to really emphasise for all councillors in this chamber that if we don't find a way to negotiate with the state government to put some actual funding towards buying the site, um, then it's just going to continue to rot and deteriorate. This um, TLPI doesn't stop what's already happening from happening. It's just being left to rot. And I haven't really seen any action from any level of government to meaningfully um, intervene or protect the building. We've talked a little bit about occupying the site and cleaning it up ourselves without permission um, and perhaps squatting it and turning it into a community facility, but the building is such, in such a degraded state that that's not really viable, unfortunately. So it really is going to need council and state government intervention and, and financial input if we are to see this property protected. I think it's a, it's a pretty hard burden um, to place on any owner to say, oh, you, we want you to maintain this heritage property to a very high standard and we're not going to give you any money to do so. I won't comment on this specific site and, and the financial means of this particular owner, but as a general proposition, I think where there are um, state heritage registered, registered properties that are considered significant and of, of value to the city as a whole, that it makes sense for council to buy those sites and to bring them back into public ownership rather than just leaving them to rot. So I hope the Lord Mayor won't consider that this is the end of the journey. I think this is a necessary step in the process, but we really need to do, start those conversations in earnest about acquiring the site or um, establishing it as some kind of community facility. There are plenty of orgs that would happily take on management of this facility if, if they had a bit of financial support to do so. And I think that's a better way forward than for it to remain in private ownership. Further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I just rise to speak briefly on this matter, and um, uh, I'd like to start by taking a step back and looking about uh, looking at what's happened here. Um, we have a significant home which is located on the Brisbane City Council Heritage Register and on the State Government's Heritage Register, um, but it's not protected. So 
Um, the bigger question here is, and I now understand why, the bigger question here is, how is it that a significant, really significant home that is protected under legislation at the local and state government is at risk from development? Now, the question the Lord Mayor answered, and there's sort of nothing to see here on the way through. Um, despite City Plan 2014, despite dozens of changes to City Plan 2014, despite this administration's ridiculous and constant claims that they protect character and heritage, this site is not protected because it is not zoned in a way that protects it from development. Under City Plan, as the Lord Mayor has just told us, it is zoned low to medium residential density and character one infill. Now, character one infill um, is an insidious zoning um, problem in my area. It allows units to be built right up to the back of um, significant character and traditional properties. Um, and, and it's happening all through um, my character suburbs. It is horrific, horrific, that there is a disconnect in our planning scheme between a heritage and state protection and the zoning under City Plan 2014. Um, now, I have for years now been saying we need to do a proper audit and map all of, all of the pre-11 and pre-1946 homes um, within the overlays within uh, City Plan. Um, I've moved motions in this place. Councillor Sutton, when she was here, moved motions in this place, um, and that would ensure. Point of order, Madam. Point uh, of order, Lord Mayor. Uh, this is around the world, um, not related to this particular item that we're debating. Oh, I think it's probably acceptable, considering what the, the item is. Councillor Johnston. I'm not sure how protecting a really old significant house and having a debate about it, which is what you brought this in here to do. Um, um, Cou is... Councillor Johnson, comments through the chair, please. And, and please be mindful that, that um, I'd put no restrictions on what you were saying. Please continue. So let me be clear. Um, I have called over and over and over again for these type of houses to be mapped, recognised and protected in city plan, and on multiple occasions the LNP councillors opposite have voted against it. Councillor Sutton has also tried. If any of those motions had gone forward, we may have had a change of zoning here to ensure this house um, was protected. Um, but this LNP administration has not done so. And now, when it seems the property may be at risk, they rush in a temporary local planning instrument to put a band-aid on what is a much bigger problem um, that we are not properly mapping and protecting these homes in our planning scheme. Um, I note that the temporary local planning instrument, um, uh, we haven't heard from the Lord Mayor whether he's going to bring an amendment to city plan forward in the next batch, uh, saying that he's going to change the zoning on the site. I would think that that's a question that needs to be answered as to what steps he's going to take to permanently protect um, this property. Um, and I would welcome his commitment today to say that he is going to change uh, the zoning uh, around, uh, around this site. But let me be clear. Um, we are talking about a house that has the highest possible protections under our scheme. But because this council has zoned it in a particular way, it allows um, entrepreneurial uh, developers to look at uh, uh, realising greater value out of the land. Um, the fact that we're putting a band-aid on it today is a good thing, um, but more importantly, this planning scheme should be amended so that we don't have to rush in here every couple of weeks and protect one and then another one and then another one. We need to do a proper audit, map them properly and ensure they are fully protected in City Plan 2014. Further speakers, Councillor Burke. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Just rise to enter the debate on the temporary local planning instrument. Uh, I'll just address some of the comments that have been made by Councillor Johnson and, and Councillor Shree. Um, a change to the zoning and city plan is one thing. I, I think the most permanent thing that anyone can do uh, to protect this site is what the Lord Mayor has announced, uh, which is that he is going to, in conjunction with the state, work to purchase this property so it becomes the property of the people of the city of Brisbane and the state of Queensland and then it will be protected permanently. That is the best change, and that is the process that the Lord Mayor is now undertaking and actually doing. So most people, you can natter away, Councillor Johnston, 
but you stand up and make these grandiose statements about what are you going to do to permanently protect it. The Lord Mayor said that publicly, that he will work with the state to bring this into public ownership. That is the most permanent fix to this issue. And you can laugh all you like, Councillor Johnston, but that is the most permanent fix to this particular uh, issue up there at Lamb House. Uh, there is work that Council is also undertaking. The Council officers uh, in the hoarding and squalor section will soon be engaging, hopefully, with the owner. We need their consent. It is private land to look at addressing some of the issues uh, of the uh, contents of the inside of the house. We know from vision that we've seen uh, that there is uh, all sorts of rubbish and various other items uh, that have been left inside the house uh, that pose a risk to the safety of the building and anyone in the house. And we are going to be working, hopefully, with the owner while we are trying to secure the site in conjunction with the state government back into public ownership. Um, but there was a little bit of debate around the zoning. Uh, every site across the city has to have a zone, Mr Chairman. Um, they have to have some zoning. This is a residential block of land. It covers eight different titles. The house itself sits on four of those titles that front onto Wild Street. There is another four blocks that front onto Leopard Street, Mr Chairman. They have different zonings. They have to have a zoning. It has to be a residential zoning because that's the use of the, the particular property, Mr Chairman. An applicant under a performance-based planning scheme can apply for a development on this site. While it is state heritage listed and local heritage listed, council would have to assess the application. What the temporary local planning instrument seeks to do is to tighten even further the existing provisions that sit on the site. Namely, the first provision that's inside this temporary local planning instrument which is to limit the number of dwelling houses or dwelling units on the site to one. One for the total land area of 3,146 square metres. One. That is the tightest protection we can put on this site, uh, Mr Chairman, so that you cannot then entertain redevelopment of the low medium density residential section or infill character behind the house uh, as well, Mr Chairman. So that tightens it even more while we work to secure this site into public ownership. On top of that, there is also provisions to protect or to give greater protection to the existing trees that are on the Leopard Street frontage, as well as singling out the fence that's there as well. There's vegetation protection orders that have been put on those trees, Mr Chairman, uh, and we are now calling those out. They're mentioned in passing, but not specifically in the State Heritage Citation. And so we want to make sure that they are captured and protected. This isn't cleaning up a mess in city plan. This is tight controls on a site specific um, part of the city of Brisbane. You can't just put in city plan these broad brush controls across the whole of that part of the city. These are very specific to this site and the conditions on this site, Mr Chairman, when it is a state or a local heritage listed place in this case. And the Lord Mayor's right. The state heritage listing takes precedence over the local heritage listing. And so there are powers under the state. Any development application would have been referred to SARA and to the state for their input. input. Um, and they would be able to provide their advice back to, uh, back to council about the state heritage significant impacts of a development if one was lodged. We don't want to have to go down that track. And that's why We've brought this TLPI here. It's why the Lord Mayor has spoken to the Deputy Premier and, and she welcomed, as the Lord Mayor said, she welcomed this. And it's great that the state government is on board with this. I spoke on Friday uh, to uh, an officer in the, or a member of the uh, Minister for Planning and State Development uh, in his office about this. He wasn't uh, available at the time. And I took them through this particular temporary local planning instrument, the reasons behind it and the urgency that it needs, Mr Chairman. Uh, and I welcome the positive way that the state government has worked with us to help protect Lamb House. Uh, and I look forward to this item getting full support in the council chamber and a speedy turnaround so that we can bring it back through council uh, and have it approved and fully protected for future generations. Further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. Oh, Lord Mayor, excuse me, Lord Mayor, if I reply. Okay. Um, I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it.
Councillors, the Public and Active Transport Report. The Deputy Mayor. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Public and Active Transport and Economic Development Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by the Deputy Mayor, seconded by Councillor Richards, the report of the Public and Active Transport and Economic Development Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, uh, Deputy Mayor? Thank you, Mr Chair. Just a couple of um, items to discuss before I get to the actual committee report from last week. First of all, I just wanted to refer back to the bus contract um, that was in the ENC and just uh, let my committee know and anybody else who's interested as well that we will be doing a presentation on the full contract and what it's, uh, the details are now that we have the contract signed by both sides. As the Lord Mayor mentioned, there were non-disclosure agreements which made it very difficult to discuss the contract during the negotiation period, but I am happy to bring that to committee um, as soon as we get back in the next session to go through the contract so everybody's clear on what that involves as well. There is also a, um, an announcement I need to make about the free seniors travel, and I hope everybody's listening because we're very sorry there was has been a bit of a mix-up on the hours of the off-peak for the seniors. So we announced a six to six, thinking that would be nice and easy for seniors to remember at six to six for the free off-peak. But TransLink has made it very clear that they won't acknowledge anything before 7 p.m. at night as being off-peak. So it will be a 7 p.m. till 6 a.m. for the seniors during the weeknights, but of course still all weekend and 8.30 to 3.30 during the day. So just an, so everybody knows that if they're getting questions on Facebook like I was, everybody very excited about it. It will be from 7 p.m. in the evening after the peak hour. Um, last week's presentation was on Brisbane's major events for the first half of 2019. It has been an extremely busy year as well. Brisbane Marketing have continued to make sure that they've got innovative whole of city approaches to delivering major events. And we looked at some of those seven significant events that were held between January and May this year. The Festival of Water Polo, Curiosity, Code, uh, the Magic Round for the NRL, Cycling Australia Track Nationals, another big weekend. Um, and the tour to Brisbane as well. So it was fantastic to just have a look at the variety of things there are to go out and see and do in Brisbane. Um, curiosity that included the World Science Festival, um, installations along the Brisbane River, and of course the Code Conference at the end of those three weeks um, was an absolutely iconic event um, and fantastic to promote all things STEM, um, science, technology, engineering and maths uh, to our young people and old people alike. The Brisbane Cycling Festival, over 17 days, 50 free events and activations. We had more than 21,000 spectators and generated a media value of 1.1 million. So we reached 19 million people on that um, cycling festival. So we had the Track Nationals, the Six Day Brisbane and the Tour de Brisbane events, all part of that festival. The Magic Round, I think everybody saw it, heard it and saw people in their colours all weekend. It was a festival of all things rugby league, over 135,000 attendees there and a very large part of those from out of the region coming into Brisbane to spend their hard earned dollars on things to see and do in Brisbane. Very exciting and we know it's popular when um, New South Wales has already made it very clear that they want to get in and get that event for next year. But we've got it for three years, so we're looking forward to building on the success of this year. The second part of the year is going to be even bigger and better when you think of things coming up like the um, Brisbane Festival, obviously, and the uh, Opera Ring, which is the Olympics of opera singing, a once in a lifetime um, opportunity that will be here in Brisbane. And first one time it's going to be actually directed by an Asian um, uh, opera director, so artist, artistic director. So that's very, very exciting coming up in November as well. There was also a petition um, in committee last week about the uh, barriers, and I'll leave that to the discussion of the chamber and wrap up after. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Cassidy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on uh, item B, the petition objecting to the installation of narrow driver barriers within council's bus fleet. And this was a petition uh, that was uh, initiated by and signed exclusively by uh, bus drivers, uh, 923 of council's employees, the hard-working bus drivers that we hear, you know, uh, the Lord Mayor and Councillor Adams now um, talk about. They'll be the ones delivering these election commitments that we're hearing. 
Uh, and the reason why these 923 bus drivers sign this petition and start this petition is because they don't feel like this council, this administration running council, is listening to their concerns around safety. Now, the process the council went through when trialling uh, these barriers following the Queensland government's inquiry uh, was that the only requirement is that they were to seek feedback uh, from drivers. Now, what this administration did was propose three types of barriers, a very small one, a slightly less small one, and then a half, half barrier. Um, I think it's the best way you can describe them. The papers describe them as narrow and, and wide barriers, but drivers that I've spoken to describe them, uh, never describe them as wide barriers. So the petition was, uh, and the position of those drivers and the union was that the drivers should also be entitled to uh, test and trial and have their views sought on full encapsulation as well, which is something this administration ruled out. And every time we raise this and ask them about that, they just uh, um, say it's a cost issue. It's all about the dollars and cents. It's not about the safety of our bus drivers. Now, why do uh, Brisbane's bus drivers have these significant concerns? Well, Mr Chair, here are some reasons. I've got here back to 2017. We could go further back. The total verbal abuse, moderate, which is you know, termed derogatory remarks, swearing and obscene gestures in 2017, 280 incidents of verbal abuse against our drivers. Extreme verbal abuse, shouting, screaming at driver or punching the bus, 83. 13 of our drivers were spat on while working in our buses on, uh, in 2017. 16 were either uh, pushed or punched in 2017. Seven of them had low-grade physical contacts so or at least touched. One of them had an object thrown at them while at work and 10 experienced theft. In 2018, 363 of our drivers were subjected to verbal abuse in the moderate form, 91 in the extreme form, 27 last year were spat on while at work, 12 were pushed or punched, uh, and nine in 2018 uh, were, had low-grade physical contact. Three of them last year had something thrown at them while they were at work and it increased to 16 thefts on the buses. This year, in January, there was 36 incidences of verbal abuse, moderate, seven of extreme, two were spat on, two were punched or pushed, and three experienced theft. February, 29 of our bus drivers had moderate verbal abuse, 10 of them were subjected to extreme verbal abuse, three of them were spat on, one of them was punched or pushed, and one had an object thrown at them while at work. In March this year, 39 of our drivers were subjected to moderate verbal abuse, eight of them to extreme verbal abuse, another one was spat on, two of them were pushed or punched, uh, and two had objects thrown at them. In April this year, 43 were subjected to verbal abuse of the moderate kind, seven extreme verbal abuse, another three were spat on, another two were punched or pushed, and another two were subjected to theft. And in May this year, 52 of our drivers were subjected to moderate verbal abuse, seven to extreme verbal abuse, two more were spat on, one more was punched or pushed, and another two were subjected to theft while at work. It's a, our, our drivers love the work they do. When I've been at depots and spoken to bus drivers, they have real pride in the work that they do, Mr Chair. But as employees of the Brisbane City Council, they deserve to be working in a zero harm environment. We cannot, Mr Chair, put a price tag on this issue. Now, we're not saying that every single one of the in excess of 1,200 buses should be fitted today with full encapsulation barriers. But the drivers who are on the front line, who are being spat on, who are having things thrown at them while they're sitting in their work chair, uh, 
who are being you know, subjected to extreme verbal abuse, who don't feel safe while at work, they need to be consulted properly about the solutions that are available to them. Now, we know we've had the discussion that in the new bus build contract, that is a possibility. Uh, we think that um, this it is incumbent on this administration to make sure, in the interim, that those high-risk routes that they now, uh, this administration now admits uh, and has publicly released details on, something that we have been uh, trying to get out of them for years, that there are problem routes in our city where these incidents are happening with more regularity, that our drivers are offered the best possible protection. So the response to this administration is given to our drivers here in this petition response is not good enough and we will not be supporting it because we are supporting our bus drivers. Further speakers? Councillor Owen. Uh, Mr Chairman, I rise to speak tonight on the, the item before us in relation to the encapsulation modules for the buses. This is something that, for many councillors in this chamber, you will know that it is a personal issue for me because I was with Manmeet Alicia two weeks before he was tragically killed. Mr Chairman, I'll continue when Councillor Johnston ceases showing disrespect to a person of this council who was killed in duty and her disrespect in this chamber. Hey. Um, Mr Chairman, point of order. Point of order. Uh, I find Councillor um, Owen's comments to be absolutely and fundamentally offensive. Um, I feel her comments uh, absolutely inappropriate and at no point at no point have I made any disrespectful uh, statement comment or action towards uh, Mamit Sharma or any other council officer and she is lying don't, don't lying go, don't, don't far, in this Councillor council Johnson. chamber and I ask you to ensure is, she withdraws is, those comments this is an, ex an exceptionally sensitive topic can I can I remind all councillors to show um, courtesy and respect when dealing with this matter, please. And I will just place it on the record, Point of Mr. order. Um, Councillors, please do not use the administrative mechanisms inside the rules to have a tete-a-tete -tete across the chamber, all right? We're trying to have the order of the agenda move through forwards. Please, uh, Councillor Johnson, your point of order. Councillor Owen has made utterly repulsive and offensive statements about me, and I would like them to be withdrawn. They are completely untrue. They are fabricated, and they need to be withdrawn, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Johnston. Uh, Councillor Owen, will you withdraw the comments? Ca uh, Mr. Chairman, Councillor Johnston's actions. When I started speaking and referred to Manmeet Alicia, she started going ha ah, and shaking her head, which is okay, evidence right. in the right video now. footage, stop. Mr. Councilor Chairman. Owen, so no, I won't Councilor withdraw. Owen, please stop. Um, the personal interactions of councillors are, in my view, secondary to the subject matter of the agenda. Can we please return? our attention to the subject matter of the agenda and not our personal feelings about each other. Councillor Owen. Point of order, Mr Chairman. Councillor Johnston. Mr Chairman, um, I ask that you direct Councillor Owen to withdraw those statements which were offensive, untrue and they are defamatory. And if she thinks that I will not take it further, she is mistaken. Please do not threaten councillors in this place. As I said, personal feelings between councillors is not a matter on this agenda. Councillor Owen, please continue. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. If you continue to make, I'm seeking of order. a ruling from you as to the meeting's local law, which you've not given. When you make a ruling saying she doesn't withdraw, I'll move dissent, and we can move on. But I cannot do that until you deal with my point of order under the meeting's local laws. As I've said, uh, I've asked Councillor Owen to withdraw. She's not done so. Um, the personal feelings of councillors are not a concern of this council. All right, Councillor Owen, please continue. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. If this is a, I'm uh, moving dissent in your ruling. Dissent in my ruling. Um, do I have to get a second? That it's procedural. All those in favour of what council of Councillor Johnson's dissent, say aye. 
And, and anyone against? It's procedural. No, carry on. Councillor Owen. It's a procedural matter. Carry on, Councillor Owen. So I would like to put it on the record, Mr Chairman, that for the bus drivers, this issue is extremely important to them. It is something that they think about day in, day out. I have had the opportunity over the years to have many interactions, in particular with the bus drivers that are based on the south side, particularly at Willawong and Sherwood depots. And I have had the union representatives come to me to discuss the concerns that they held with the encapsulation and about the safety concerns that they have when they are driving every day. In order to help the bus drivers, rather than gain political point scoring opportunities, I have facilitated opportunities for bus drivers and the union representatives to have direct discussions with senior police working in the area that were coordinating the intelligence gathering to assess the routes. And they appreciated that opportunity to have those direct conversations. I know that many of the bus drivers are still feeling the loss of man meat. I was with man meat two weeks before he was tragically killed. I was there with many of our bus drivers and many of the community when they farewelled him for his journey home. And for any of you who know the cultural practices, you would realise that this is a situation that is extremely personally sensitive for so many people, but it is something that once you encounter it, you can never go back. The grief that was displayed that day when we farewelled Manmeet for his journey home will be forever etched in my memory. The grief that I witnessed when I travelled to his home village of Alicia in India and personally conveyed condolences to his friends and his relatives was appreciated, but they were still feeling that grief. We need to make sure that our bus drivers know how much their safety is a concern for this administration and all councillors in this place. Over the years, we had many projectile incidents in my ward. Everyone kept saying to me, oh, you're not going to catch these people who are throwing rocks at the buses or le lem unripe, unripe le lemons that go through the windows of a driver's window and render him unconscious when he's driving a bus down Algester Road outside my office. But catch them we did. And I would not sit back and do nothing and what we are doing at the moment is something that is important. It must be dealt with properly and you cannot just rush ahead and implement things that might not necessarily be the most beneficial given the circumstances. This was a very, very unusual and isolated situation. We have had situations 
where police have been attacked on our buses and our dr bus driver actually rendered aid to the police officers and drove them out of that particular street to safety. That driver wouldn't have been able to have helped those police officers if he was completely encapsulated. We cannot anticipate every situ single situation. We have implemented CCTV on our buses. We have implemented shatterproof glass. We have implemented procedures in, relations to project in relation to projectiles. There are ways for the bus drivers to communicate if they are concerned about security and safety. But what it comes down to, first and foremost, is that the general public who are acting in a manner that is disrespectful and unsafe and abusive to our bus drivers, they need to stop. Our drivers, and I agree with Councillor Cassidy, our drivers need to be able to go to work and know that they're not going to be abused or spat on or subjected to verbal abuse. And the very people who can stop that are the very people who get on our buses. Because all I ask is that when people travel on our buses, say good morning or good afternoon or good evening to our bus drivers. Say thank you when they deliver you to your destination. Because they do love their job. They do provide a great service. They are wonderful people. And this is where, after that tragic incident a couple of years ago, we saw signs emerging across this city. Without any planning, they went up everywhere saying, we love our bus drivers. So let's see that again. Let's see people behaving respectfully to each other, to our bus drivers and on all forms of public transport, because it doesn't take too much to be kind and compassionate and decent to another human being. I do know that some of the bus drivers have had concerns through the testing process in regards to glare, and we have to, we have to take those concerns seriously. I understand that different drivers have different views of the different modules for encapsulation. But we have to make sure that we make these decisions for the right reasons, not for political point scoring. Point of order. Yes, uh, point of order. Just you. on a, a procedural matter, can I just request that item B be taken seriatim? I didn't mention that earlier. Yes. Further, further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Yes, I rise to speak on uh, item B. Um, firstly, can I say that um, uh, this is a petition uh, to discuss the installation of driver barriers within buses. Um, what I've just heard and what I object to is Councillor Owen making this speech about herself. Um, that whole speech um, was premised on me, me, me. Um, I didn't actually hear a lot about the, um, uh, the driver's barriers, uh, and certainly every single councillor in this place yeah. um, was disturbed and upset by what happened to Mamit Sharma. And for Councillor Owen to stand yeah, up um, and— C Councillor Johnston, I, I trust you see the irony of mm. when you're saying another person's talking about themselves, and then you do much the same. Can, can you please just stick to the— the substance well, of the matter at hand. Yeah, and you just told her it was quite okay. So I'm sorry, if it's okay for her to speak about these matters, then clearly it must be okay for me. Well, you weren't talking about these matters, you were talking about Councillor Owen. So can you just please talk about the substance? So you're not allowed to mention in debate, just to be clear, another councillor's debate. Of course you are. Right, thank you. So I will continue. Um, I, 
I am disturbed, as were all other councillors in this place at the time, that one of our bus drivers had died. Um, we had a, you know, a really difficult discussion about that in this place. Um, but since then, there have been really practical issues which need to be resolved to ensure that council bus drivers working in our community are safe and protected from harm in their workplace. Um, now, to my knowledge, all the way through this process, there has been um, division about what the best type of bus barrier uh, for the bus drivers has been. And now, as I understand it today before us, we have a petition with about a thousand bus drivers having signed it, um, saying that they don't support um, the bus barrier being installed by council. Now, um, I, I have genuine concerns about that. If a thousand bus drivers are saying to us uh, that they don't think council's got this right, um, then that is something we should all be concerned about. It's not a, I was more upset by Mamit's death than you were upset. I mean, that's just, that's just childish debate. Um, the issue here is whether or not we have the right safety measure in place that will be um, supported by our bus drivers and will give them the greatest possible protection. Now, a thousand bus drivers don't think we've got it right, and they've done a petition asking us to consider um, uh, what we are doing, and I, for one, am listening. I do not believe that we should be pushing ahead without their support. Um, and if a thousand people sign a petition saying that there is a problem, we as a council should be listening. The emotion needs to be taken out of this debate, and we need to make the right decision to ensure that our staff members at council are protected from harm in their workplace. Further speakers? Councillor Adams, Deputy Mayor, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I think we need to bring it back to the case at point. The case at point is a petition that came in from the RTBU protesting the installation of a bus driver barrier on the council bus fleet. And I don't say that lightly. It was a petition from the RTBU because it actually was authorised by the RTBU, which you don't actually usually need on a petition, but it was authorised by the union. I think one thing that we all agree on in this place is that all workers, whether they be bus drivers or LAS officers or people that work in Brisbane Square or Green Square, need to feel safe when they come to work, need to feel secure and need to be safe and be secure when they come to work as well. And I would have to say that dr driver safety has to be something that is above politics. Unfortunately, in this case, I'm not sure if this petition is above politics, but we are taking it at face value. It is very disappointing that council has been out to comprehensive consultation with bus drivers, bus drivers who were then proactively urged not to engage with council, but to sign the union petition. And that is disappointing because that puts this back into the political basket, and that's not where it should be. This should be an opportunity for council bus drivers to tell us what they want, not to be told by the unions not to speak to us. And we did go out and speak to them, and we did put forward three options. We sought survey responses between June 2018 and March 2019. And many drivers actually said that they didn't want any barriers at all. They felt that it would impede their work environment. We trialled three, a wide barrier, a partial frameless barrier and a narrow barrier. And ultimately, we couldn't get a majority agreement on any one of those barriers, but we did get a majority of uh, the largest portion of those surveyed saying that the narrow barrier was probably the one that they would pick out of all of those. Overwhelmingly, our data highlights the random nature that bus driver assaults occur. And Councillor Cassidy actually outlined the month by month assaults, which are absolutely not acceptable in the workplace. But again, unfortunately, 95 per cent of them are behaviour driven. Four, I listened very carefully, Councillor Cassidy, in each of those months, four of them were physical abuse. So we have over 6,000 bus stops, over 3 million trips per year. We have four recorded physical assaults a month, four too many, absolutely four too many. 
but no amount of barrier, unfortunately, is going to stop verbal abuse, vicious verbal abuse, spitting. Actually, indications show that where they've put in wide barriers, that spitting actually increases as the assault on bus drivers. And don't let's start on the actual full enclosure barrier. The full enclosure barrier, obviously, we trialled it, the wide barrier, and we had to remove it after two months of the consultation because there was such high volume of driver complaints. Now, I take note here that there is no suggestion from this petition on what they would like, that they just don't like what we're suggesting. But the concerns around visibility, glare, lack of airflow, drivers were constantly having to lean forward to speak to customers. They're going to be totally cut off on a full enclosure. Some drivers actually flat out refused to drive a bus with a wide barrier that was installed. So we're going for the happy balance, the narrow barrier. We get some protection. We, get, we got driver feedback. We looked at the impact on customers. We had a look. We went through the Queensland Bus Industry Council. They indicated that that aligned with the direction that was being adopted by other operators across private industry. And so we are moving forward with the narrow barriers. We considered a whole lot of things when deciding on these barriers. The additional protection, the actual installation of the barrier, and if it actually generates additional risk factors, a bus driver totally enclosed is absolutely inaccessible if something does happen in the incidence of a bus driver having a heart attack or being injured or there's an accident or they need to get out of the bus quickly. It'll be very difficult in a full enclosure. We did listen to the feedback of the bus drivers and we did actually consult and we feel that this is the best solution for the majority of bus drivers. We have heard before that the RTBU want full encapsulation, but that is not what has been indicated on this petition here tonight. And as I said before, what we have seen with full encapsulation, that it increases spitting offences. Offenses. I said it makes it very difficult for the driver to get out in an emergency. And there was concerns about the driver entrapment and instances of claustrophobia. And again, also retrofitting all the air con vents, because you can imagine in a Brisbane climate, in an encapsulated area, that needs to be separately air conditioned for them to be comfortable in their workplace as well. So the reality is that we are doing all we can to make the safe work environment for our bus drivers. We are delivering resilience training to help them deal with those antisocial events. There are static guards at the interchanges. We've got CCTV cameras, anti-shutter film on the bus windows, situational awareness, de-escalation training. We have been asking the minister on multiple occasions for 50 senior network officers. We did get a reply last week. We're getting 16 senior network officers across southeast Queensland. So I'm not um, holding my breath too many of them actually being on Brisbane buses. But we are also waiting to see the essential funding from the state government grant for the installation of these as well. What it comes down to is we are doing everything in our power to make Brisbane bus drivers safe. And as it stands, we will wait the outcome of that grant application and we will continue to work with our bus drivers and the RTBU to make sure that they feel safe and are as safe as possible in their workplace. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you. All right. I'll put uh, the resolution for item A. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now to item B. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. No. The ayes have it. Division. Division. Division called by Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Cook. Ayes to my right, no to my left. Please ring the bells.
Attendance, please close the bars. Clerks, please read, please read the result. Mr Chair, the ayes have it. The voting being 17 in favour and 7 against. The ayes have it. Please return to your chairs. Councillors, the Infrastructure Committee report. Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mr Chair. I move that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Huang, that the report of the Infrastructure Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate? Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Mr Chair. We had two presentations at committee last week. One was about the uh, proposed heavy vehicle trial, um, the heavy vehicle ban trial on Watson Road in Acacia Ridge. This is one uh, that will commence on the 1st of July. Uh, it follows on from work that council has undertaken from 2015. Uh, just to be clear, council buses and uh, waste collection vehicles will not be subject to this ban. Uh, and certainly this has been something that has been strongly advocated by the local councillor, Councillor Griffiths. Um, I believe that he is happy with the outcome as it is proposed. We've put a lot of work into this. There's been some good um, engagement with the Department of Transport and Main Roads. Um, we're putting in a lot of signage to try and make sure that people are well aware of what the new, um, new proposed routes will be. Uh, to direct those heavy vehicles that are seeking to go to the resource recovery location. So uh, I hope that this will be a phenomenal success and hope to see a significant improvement. There are certainly a number of vehicles that are travelling down there. In 2017, we um, did an origin destination survey and found that there were 800 heavy vehicles travelling um, down this particular route each and every day. So hopefully we will see a significant a very significant reduction in those vehicles uh, travelling down Watson Road in future. The second presentation was on the Wynnum Road Corridor Stage 1 and Stage 1B um, projects. So uh, this is particularly um, on the northern side of the project. We're seeing the works nearing completion with pavements 80% complete, public utilities at 95% completed with uh, the decorative works to the um, noise attenuation nearly complete. We've got the upgrade cycleway and footpaths also nearly completed and the new intersection at Kulparam Street was opened um, in April of this year. We will be undertaking a major switch onto the southern side of the corridor this year and we uh, have got the public, public utilities there at about 20 per cent complete. We have undertaken a trial to close Bennett's Road, uh, the right-hand turn, in order to reduce night works uh, with two alternate routes that have been um, proposed. The trial has been completed. Uh, we did get feedback, so we got 10 pieces of feedback, uh, nine negative and one neutral. Uh, we certainly believe that, and there's been consultation with local councillor, uh, Councillor Cook, to um, walk her through and make sure that she's comfortable with what is proposed. Uh, I understand she is comfortable because she would prefer to have day works rather than night works um, in this specific location. So hopefully um, we'll see good outcomes as a result of both of these particular initiatives. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? Councillor Griffiths. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I just rise to speak on item A, uh, Watson Road truck diversion. Um, as Councillor Cooper was saying, um, it has been a, a long process uh, for residents and, um, and for business down in um, Acacia Ridge uh, to see this, uh, this trial come to fruition. Um, it's certainly been something that I've been supporting uh, during my time in council, and so I welcome the trial, and I thank uh, Councillor Cooper uh, for uh, delivering on this. I um, understand that the trial uh, will seek to divert um, at least half the trucks uh, away from Watson Road. The other half of the trucks potentially can use the street because there is still a, um, the address of the business that they're visiting, BMI, is actually in Watson Road. So technically it's, it's difficult to get them off that particular road. Um, However, we also have the opportunity time and, and can time uh, sort of come in in a timely way uh, where the um, BMI is going through a development application at the moment. So potentially this trial and its findings could fit 
with some of the recommendations we make to BMI about turns uh, into their property and out of their property. So I actually think this makes a great deal of sense, um, this trial. I've written to the uh, state, um, state members uh, in relation to this issue. One of the things we can't do is enforce uh, the truck ban, um, but um, the state needs to do that. So I've made it really clear to our state members um, that if we want this to work, we need to have their involvement as well. And it's a lot of things council does. We do depend on the state um, to, to work in conjunction with us. So overall, I think this is a, a good opportunity for the local community down there. They've certainly been plagued by these 800 trucks a day. There have been no major um, accidents down there. There's been a truck rollover, but uh, no injuries per se. But no, um, no suburban area should have 800 trucks a day travelling through it. And particularly when there's existing alternate routes that they can use that aren't much longer, this is a, a really sensible move. Um, so yes, I, I welcome it. Thank you. Further speakers? Councillor Shree. Thanks, Mr Chair. I'd um, just rise on to speak on item B around the um, Wynnum Road Corridor project. Um, this project is still causing a lot of disruption and um, frustration for a lot of residents in my ward. A lot of people are still losing sleep and um, finding that their, their, um, the clothes on the line in the backyard and their back windows are caked with a lot more dust and grime than than used to occur prior to this work starting. So there are still some serious concerns in terms of how the construction site and how the work is being managed. Um, I'm not satisfied that the, um, the measures to control erosion and sediment and airborne dust pollution are sa satisfactory. Um, I know the officers are trying, but there's, there's still a lot of dust in, in the air along that corridor. Um, so whatever measures or um, rules the council is currently imposing simply aren't enough. Um, it's not pleasant at all as a pedestrian to be along that corridor. You find a, it, it just feels a lot dustier when, you, when you're inhaling and um, makes for a, um, a much less comfortable uh, environment. But above and beyond that, we're still seeing a lot of um, what I would describe as excessive disruption to the footpaths, both on the northern and on the southern side. Um, there's a section of the southern footpath outside the former post office, um, just just to the the west of the Heidelberg Street intersection. And that that area is still really uneven. It's not um, DDA compliant. It's been left like that for months now. And it feels like even when we raise these concerns, the project team doesn't really do anything about it. So the, the walkway is still not wide enough for two um, strollers or bicycles or even a couple of people to pass each other at the same time, and that means that pedestrians are sort of having to wait in the middle of the roadway while oncoming pedestrians from the other direction move through that narrow area. So there are quite a few significant safety concerns around how the construction process is being managed, and I'm not satisfied that Council is doing um, its duty and, and fulfilling its duty of care to protect people during that construction period. Um, I do want to thank and acknowledge the administration for supporting the, the rename into Culpuram Street, which we um, discussed previously. Just for the record, the pronunciation is, is more like Culpuram, which, um, depending on which linguist or elder you talk to, is the name for that creek corridor and is sort of the same root word as the, the name of the suburb, Kuparu. But um, yeah, I just, I'm just I'm feeling really sad for the people who live along there because their lives have, have really been turned upside down by this project. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really hard for a community to bear the brunt of a road winding project like this, particularly when um, there's no real case to be made that it's going to improve traffic congestion long term. And I, I just genuinely feel for those, for those residents, the um, amount of disruption, the amount of lost sleep, the the sense of having your local neighbourhood torn up and divided by a major road is really disempowering and and, um, and, and crushing for people. What used to feel like a connected neighbourhood where you had a, a row of small local businesses where people could duck across the road to get to the local park, where there were shady trees shading the footpaths, where there were a series of character houses, all that's lost now. Um, We've spent $115 million 
replacing established trees, parkland, and character homes with bitumen. That's what we've done. We spent $115 million replacing people's homes with bitumen um, in a manner that doesn't accord with modern transport planning principles, where there's no evidence to suggest that this will long-term improve traffic congestion, um, where the short-term benefits are marginal at best, and where the negative impacts upon the local community are, are significant and ongoing. So I hope this administration understands the damage it has done and the pain it has caused. I hope the administration understands what a woeful waste of ratepayer money this project has been um, and that it will not make the same mistake again and that it will not seek to widen other roads in the inner city in this way. It's, um, it's been a categorical disaster and um, I'm just really disappointed that this administration wouldn't listen to local residents when they raised those concerns early on. Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. I just rise briefly to speak on item B. Um, this is the part that I'm interested in at this stage is 1B, uh, which is the temporary right-hand closure um, from Bennett's Road. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Councillor Cooper um, for her help with this uh, particular part of the project. Um, when this was first raised with me, I had um, significant uh, community feedback um, opposing the temporary closure. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I met with city projects to negotiate uh, a temporary closure for a four week trial period. And I thank the City Projects team for the work that they've done in uh, conducting community consultation uh, on site at the start of that trial. During the trial, uh, as Councillor Cooper has said, we've had uh, only 10 uh, submissions from the community. I must admit I was um, quite surprised about that number um, and expressed that view to the project team um, that it wasn't uh, higher given the, the high level of community interest uh, in that particular site. But um, despite that, uh, we have now discussed um, what the best way forward would be, and um, we have agreed to uh, complete uh, that project with the temporary right-hand closure remaining in place, uh, which I, um, uh, I guess, reluctantly agreed to. But I think the fact that we have hundreds of vehicles using that, uh, that right-hand turn each day and um, only 10 complaints uh, doesn't really leave us with any other options. Um, we did have some complaints around night works, noisy night works, which I'm assured by the project team uh, was in relation to the removal of the traffic lights at that location. And I've asked the team to keep the community updated about when those traffic lights will be reinstated. The other thing, um, with this particular location um, that I had asked about was the uh, pedestrian and cycling access, uh, which again, I'm assured by the team are temporary measures um, and we will see those uh, 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 rectified because there are some issues particularly that have been raised by uh, uh, the East Region Bicycle User Group. And um, I've asked the project team to also uh, liaise with them directly around those concerns. Uh, on that basis, uh, the trial uh, will no longer be a trial. Uh, that temporary right-hand closure will be in place until the completion of the project. I have asked for some more clarity around completion dates, uh, and I've been told that they will be uh, defined further once the tram track removal has taken place. Um, some residents had also expressed concern about uh, the historical significance of those tram tracks. Uh, but again, we've had um, the historical section uh, of city projects look into that, um, and they have resolved those issues for the community, and I thank them for doing that work as well. Uh, so for now, uh, we will continue to monitor that situation. Uh, there will be communication going out to the community around the extension uh, of those that right-hand closure, uh, and we will um, wait now uh, to get those updates about the timing for completion on that project. Further speakers? Councillor Cooper. 
very briefly, uh, Mr Chairman. I thank um, Councillor Griffiths and Councillor Cook for their comments. I, I respect what they have to say and certainly just want to assure the councillors that um, we will continue to work closely with them. Uh, just with respect to the comment of Councillor Shree, uh, the suggestion that this project is only for one purpose is not correct. This, this project serves a range of purposes. This is a very important connection to the eastern suburbs, but also when you look at the statistics for traffic incidents in this location, 118 incidents over a five-year period between La Trobe Street and Riding Road is something of deep concern to Council. Uh, this, program, this project also delivers um, widening of the road, but it also delivers a two-way off-road bikeway. It realigns bus stops and removes right-hand turn movements for significant improvements to safety as well as uh, congestion benefits. So I disagree with him. Uh, this is something I believe that is an important project, and we certainly will be continuing to deliver these kinds of projects for our great city. Thank you, Mr Thank Chair. You. I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Is the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Council of the City Planning Committee report. Councillor Burke. Thanks, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, I move the report of the City Planning Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded, Mr Chair. It's been moved by Councillor Burke, seconded by Councillor Toomey. The report of the City Planning Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Burke? Uh, thanks very much, Mr Chairman. Uh, I just want to, before I get to the committee report, uh, I just want to, I can't remember whether I did in the TLPI debate put on record my thanks for the council officers who have worked very hard uh, to get that TLPI prepared and ready uh, so it could be here today. And I want to just acknowledge and thank uh, the council officers who have been involved in that um, for their hard work. Um, could I also just speak quickly to um, uh, the three items? There's three items. There's a petition uh, about the Corso at Seven Hills being included as part of the Village Precinct Projects Initiative. Uh, there's a petition requesting Council allow a martial arts facility uh, down in Councillor Griffiths Ward to continue to operate in industrial zoning. Uh, but there was a committee presentation, uh, Mr Chairman, about the intergenerational planning forum that Council held two weeks ago. Uh, this is an outcome of Brisbane's Future Blueprint that we hold an annual intergenerational forum. Uh, there was uh, a rich and diverse group of people uh, in the room. Over 350 people attended, residents attended uh, the forum, Mr Chairman, uh, where we had a number of speakers including Bernard Salt, uh, who provided interesting information, uh, and then Nicole Dyson, who led uh, a fantastic discussion session with the residents uh, about how they can be drivers of change in their local community, but also uh, what change they would like to see happening in the city as well, Mr Chairman. Uh, this is uh, a part of our ongoing engagement with the residents of Brisbane, uh, not just around planning issues, Mr Chairman, but about livability and about our city more broadly. Uh, and it's a great initiative and something that I encourage all, res all, re all residents to become involved with when we hold next year's intergenerational planning forum, but also encourage all councillors to come and attend. Um, we had a um, very rich, as I said, and diverse group of people. We split people up. So if you had a married couple uh, that came or a couple uh, that came, we tried to move people around on tables so that you didn't end up with uh, eastern suburbs people sitting at one table and western suburbs people sitting at another or uh, certain interest groups sitting at one table so that we actually facilitated real discussion and got a diverse range of views at those tables to help get some really great uh, feedback and outcomes and ideas out of that discussion session with Nicole Dyson. And I commend the report to the council chamber. Further speakers? Councillor Cook. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. I rise to speak on item B, the petition requesting that the Corso Seven Hills be fully funded and constructed as part of the Village Precinct Project in 2019-20. Mr Chair, this is the latest petition, number four, in fact, in this 10-year campaign by my community to have the Corso Precinct upgraded. This petition was presented back in February, Mr Chair, which gave this LNP administration plenty of time to consider its contents and come back to my community. However, Mr Chair, here we are, uh, four months later and just one day out from the budget considering it today. This petition is in addition to the one, as I said, uh, presented in October 2011, August 2014 and November 2018. And I should note that there is still another petition, in fact outstanding, that was presented in February this year as well uh, regarding car parking at the same location. 
Mr Chair, this petition has 127 signatures. The majority of which uh, come from the local area and from residents who frequent the shops located at the Corso. Uh, there are also hundreds of other signatures uh, from the previous petitions. Now, I'm sure uh, no one in this chamber has forgotten because I've spoken on this topic a number of times, but in case you have, uh, this is the same precinct where the former Lord Mayor uh, went around my community during the by-election uh, in Morningside and told them, promised to them, that he would deliver uh, this precinct uh, to the people of my ward. Uh, he did not, Mr Chair. He delivered uh, nothing, which, to be quite frank, is exactly what my community has come to expect from this LNP administration. This administration committed this time last year to investigate the precinct. In fact, uh, that was $40,000 that was dedicated to the project. Uh, Mr Chair, that was, I think I said at the time, a half-hearted attempt uh, to keep my residents quiet because um, the Lord Mayor knew that he had made a mistake in failing to deliver on his promise. Um, but again, Mr Chair, here we are, a day before the budget, and these investigations, uh, to my knowledge, have not occurred. I have not been consulted as the local councillor, and certainly to my knowledge, nor has my community been consulted. Mr Chair, uh, looking at this petition response today, uh, clearly it states that my residents have to continue to wait for any commitment to fully fund this project because the investigation works have simply not been completed. Um, Mr Chair, 12 months later, um, I appreciate we've got two weeks left. I've asked Councillor Burke uh, for some assurances that that would occur. Um, he has indicated to me that they will, uh, but as I said, we're a day out from the budget. Um, this petition clearly foresaw that uh, those investigations would, I think my community expected that they would have taken place by this time, which they have not. Um, it's an absolute joke, to be quite frank. Um, this LNP administration is a joke. You can't deliver, you make promises that you can't keep, and you perpetually fail to deliver for our suburbs, particularly those in Labor wards. Mr Chair, um, I'm sure Councillor Burke will jump up and down and claim that that's not the case, um, but I'd like to compare this to the treatment of other wards um, and their village precinct projects. Mr Chair, your ward of Inogra, we saw a village precinct project approved with a petition of only 141 signatures last year. That wasn't for planning, Mr Chair. That was for the project to be planned, designed and delivered in this financial year. Um, that project was allegedly also getting an on-site kiosk um, to provide the local community an opportunity with input. Um, I'm not sure if you got that kiosk, Mr Chair, but certainly I'm still waiting for one in the Corso, um, and I'm still waiting for a fully funded project. I'm not sure if those things are reserved exclusively for LNP wards or not. Um, Mr Chair, I've written to the Lord Mayor, I've written to Councillor Burke on this issue, um, including the need to formalise the car park on Darcy Road. Uh, we saw the whole debacle last year uh, with, oh sorry, that was this year, earlier this year, uh, with um, garden beds um, seemingly appearing overnight with dead plants in it. Um, absolutely bizarre. Um, yet the things that my community has asked for um, are not delivered and they're not heard um, by this administration. I think it's a shame um, that the uh, new Lord Mayor wants to follow in the footsteps of the last one in this failure to deliver. Um, it seems that this administration are incapable of taking the politics out of this decision making and treating Seven Hills and more broadly the Morningside Ward equally. Um, happy though, Mr Chair, this administration is happy to take uh, their money to uh, raise their rates above um, what we have seen uh, across the city. Uh, Seven Hills has endured, as you heard earlier today, some of the highest rate rises in the city, uh, 45 million in rates over the last year, which has resulted in uh, a mere $5 million investment in my ward. 
Mr Chair, I'm not going to hold my breath to see this project actually delivered by this LNP administration tomorrow. Certainly, I will applaud it if it is. Um, but it appears that this administration will delay, avoid and spend their time on self-promotion before they prioritise the people of the city and the people of Seven Hills and Morningside. The recommendation today does not come with a commitment for full funding and delivery. Um, my residents know what to expect, um, and certainly their expectations are incredibly low at this point in time, after 10 years of campaigning. Today, uh, Mr Chair, we will support this recommendation um, purely on the basis to not impede any potential future commitment. Um, but as I said, they've been fighting for 10 years. Um, they will continue to fight to get their fair share so that this project that was promised to them um, can finally be delivered, not only for the people of Seven Hills, but for the Morningside Ward more generally. Further speakers? Councillor Burke. Um, thanks, Mr Chairman. I'm not going to jump up and down as Councillor Cook uh, said I might, uh, but I am going to just put on the record uh, a few things, uh, Mr Chairman, about uh, this particular petition uh, down there at the Corso in Seven Hills. So, um, a lot of things were said by Councillor Cook um, that we should stop politicising this project, yet she spent nearly 10 minutes politicising this project and uh, trying to lay the blame on this administration and having digs at myself and at the Lord Mayor and previous Lord Mayors, Mr Chairman. Um, this project is being designed. Um, this project is under investigation. Uh, it was a commitment in last year's council budget, uh, and you only have one more sleep to go, Councillor Cook, uh, to find out whether it's funded in this year's council budget, Mr Chairman, uh, through you. Um, so the only people who have tried to politicise this project uh, is the Australian Labor Party, Mr Chairman. Um, we go about the city uh, and we look at these precincts as part of what was SKIPS, uh, is now village precinct projects, uh, and we identify sites across the city, and some sites are easier to implement and you can design and deliver in one year. Some sites are more complex. Some sites require more design work. Some sites have other issues, and Councillor Cook talked at great length about parking issues on Darcy Street or Darcy Road, uh, which forms part uh, of this area. Um, and Mr Chairman, those have to be taken into consideration uh, as part of the investigation work. Point of order, uh, Mr the Chair. Account. Point of order to you, Councillor Cook. I'm just concerned that Councillor Burke is misleading the chamber. He's previously stated that he will not consider that's, that's the not, car parking not what, not what as part of this today. precinct. Not, now he appears. This is not what point of orders are for, Councillor Burke. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, I didn't say it was going to be part of any future village precinct project as funded in the budget. What I said is that it is part of this area and it is a complex area, Mr. Chairman. Um, what Councillor Cook did say, you know, once again not wanting to politicise it, as she said, um, was that this administration is a joke. I think she called the process a joke and the administration a joke a couple of times. What's a joke is, what's a joke is that you're going to vote for this recommendation today, even though in the papers before us you say you don't support the recommendation. So in the space of a week, you have changed your position on this. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order to you, Councillor. Now, Councillor Burke is simply lying to the chamber no, because look, last week, no, you can't use point in of the order. back of this you chamber, you I told use him a point I of order did. As a debating tool, you can't inter you can't use point of orders to interrupt people to make a counter argument. Councillor Councillor Burke, please continue. And, and and thanks, Mr. Chairman. I thank Councillor Cook for the interjection because we did have a discussion last week, um, and uh, I thought our discussion was that you weren't going to make a issue of it um, because you were going to support the recommendation, you acknowledged that it had changed. But you just stood up in here for eight minutes and politicised the issue and laid into myself and laid into the Lord Mayor and the previous Lord Mayor and the council officers who were doing this work and turned it into a political issue. So all bets are off, Councillor Cook. All bets, all, well, um, Councillor Cook, those words are not true. And you as a lawyer should be a little bit more careful in what you uh, said, hang on, because Councillor Cook, you know, because Councillor Burke, please stop. Councillor Cook, I've let a bit go. Can you please cease interjecting? Um, and if you can't control yourself with the interjections, can you please use a more proportional term than the one you're using? Councillor Burke, please continue. Because what did I not, just say? So, please 
please find a more proportional term, Councillor Cook. And if you do it again, I will formally name you through the papers. So, Councillor Burke. Item, item 18 of the, of the report before us, Councillor Curral Cook, Councillor from Morningside was consulted and does not support the recommendation. Um, the email from the, on the 31st of May says, thank you, thank you, Council Officer's name. I do not agree with the recommendation in this petition and I await the recommendation in the remaining petitions. And Councillor Cook just stood up in here and said they will be supporting it today. So, so there you go. Like, I'm not going to sit here and get lambasted for seven or eight minutes on a politicisation of this issue and be lectured about it and not through you, Mr Chairman, back to you, Councillor Cook, and go, well, I'm going to call you out. All right. I'm going to call you out on this stuff. You want a grandstand? Okay, Councillor Cook, I'm I direct you to cease interjecting. Uh, uh, and if you do not comply with my direction, you will be warned. Councillor Burke. This council goes through a process when it comes to village precinct projects. We deliver investigations, we deliver projects that are small and the project itself when we can. And then we also do those investigation works and consider them as future budgets. That is the process that the council officers have been undertaking on this particular site. And Councillor Cook will be consulted uh, once the detailed uh, work has been undertaken and completed by the council officers. Um, that's the process, Mr Chairman, through you to everyone who's watching and the councillors in the chamber. Um, I don't, though, think that it's fair for councillors to stand up in here and just have a crack for no reason when the process has been well established and is being undertaken by the council officers. And I commend the report to the council chamber. Um, <clears throat> I'll now put the, put the uh, motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And to the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Report, please. Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I move that the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee held on Tuesday, the 4th of June, 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It has been moved by Councillor Hammond, seconded by Councillor Richards, the report of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June, 2019, be adopted. Councillor Hammond. Any further speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I just rise to speak on uh, item a, the, uh, a summary presentation for um, parks, environment and sustainability. Um, I would just like to address some comments to um, a few of the key areas of uh, the parks uh, portfolio, and particularly um, to start with the um, bush care uh, buyback scheme. Um, this is an area where I have been asking council for some period of time to buy back uh, bushland in my area. And uh, certainly there seemed to be some indication when I inherited um, part of Oxley uh, from Councillor Burke last year that the administration was listening. Uh, the Lord Mayor went out publicly in the papers, um, probably nearly close to four years ago now, uh, stating that he would purchase additional uh, bushland in Oxley. However, uh, he's not done so. Um, I spoke to the new Lord Mayor about this several weeks ago, and uh, whilst he nodded, um, I'm coming to the conclusion, given he's been in the job for nearly two months and has not actually dealt with a single issue that I've put to him in way of actually carrying it out or assisting, um, that this also may go by the wayside. So I'm quite interested in what might happen in the budget uh, tomorrow. We have very significant parcels of remnant bushland in Oxley. Uh, that need to be uh, brought back. Um, and I'll start with um, the balance of the uh, Knossos side. And, and even some of these um, uh, probably don't need buyback either. Um, uh, hopefully we would have some covenants with respect to the private land um, that is uh, in this area and adjoins... Sorry, excuse um, me, Councillor Johnson. Again, there's a, there's a few private conversations going on. Can uh, councillors please take those private conversations outside if they wish to continue them, but allow Councillor Johnson to be heard in silence. Thank you. Councillor Johnston. Look, I, I, all I can hear is the air conditioner. I can't hear anybody, and um, nobody's, hearing... nobody's bothering me, can I just say. Well, okay. Um, well, I, yeah, I could hear, okay. and I felt that okay more courtesy was due to your speech, okay? Well, I'd certainly, I, certainly, uh, I certainly don't have a problem, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, so uh, certainly um, I would hope that we can take steps to acquire this very significant remnant bushland. It adjoins uh, the Fort Road Bush Care Group, uh, of, I'm sorry, the 
Fort Road um, bushland area, uh, which also adjoins Rocks Riverside a little bit along the river. Uh, these are very, very significant um, uh, pieces of uh, Brisbane uh, bushland, and they deserve to be protected. I also spoke with the uh, Lord Mayor about uh, the uh, Oxley Secondary College site. Now, I note that Councillor Burke was the both um, in charge of this portfolio area and also the local councillor for um, what, eight years um, and made no steps to acquire or to protect or to um, action the protection of the very significant uh, bushland reserve and also recreational space on the Oxley Secondary College. Um, even when he had a Liberal LNP state member um, uh, in the state seat, he didn't seem to take any action, to my knowledge. However, as soon as I became the local councillor, I took steps to uh, ask the state and council uh, to work together and for council to acquire this land uh, from the state government. And it does seem that the state will give the land to council. Uh, uh, both the uh, recreational fields at the bottom and the bushland, which runs down the western uh, corridor of the site, which also links to the uh, which also links to the Fort Road bush care area. Um, now, my understanding is they will do that free of charge. And again, I've spoken personally with the Lord Mayor to make sure this happens, because unfortunately, this LNP administration doesn't have much of a track record uh, when it comes to bushland acquisition uh, or parks acquisition uh, in my ward of Tennyson. And uh, the RSPCA site is an excellent example of that, where the state offers it uh, free to point of order. And they yeah, point of order to you, Councillor Hammond. She's got a lot of leeway on this. Can you bring it back to it? It was a broad outline of um, what the committee, what the roles of um, the Environment Parks Committee is, not a, just a tirade on repeating herself. Can you bring it back? Uh, Councillor Johnson, please be mindful of, re of relevance. Um, you have been given a lot of leeway. Um, you know, please um, be mindful of the audience. So let's be clear. This is about the whole portfolio. That's what the presentation was about. Um, it wasn't specific. Um, it was an overview and a summary of all aspects of the portfolio. One of the key aspects, in my view, is about protecting and preserving bushland and recreational spaces in our city. And guess what? Our current Lord Mayor actually agrees with me. It would just seem that his parks chairman doesn't. She thinks me talking about the need to preserve parks and bushland in our city is irrelevant to Councilor her portfolio. Johnston, what have, I've asked you to try to refrain from personal attacks. Can you please just stick to the topic? That's not a personal attack. Right. I'm speaking to the issues, which are that this chairman of the Parks, Environment and Sustainability Council just stood up and said that me talking about bushland buyback and recreational space was not relevant to a debate in her portfolio. So let me be clear, that is what happened. Now, back to where I was. This council has a track record of not delivering in Tennyson Ward. It is critical that this council works constructively with uh, the state government to acquire the land at the Oxley Secondary College site. If left to Councillor Burke, it is my view that he will play politics and we will not get a good result on this site. For eight years as the local councillor, including his time as the parks chairman, he failed to take any action. Now, I would hope, um, uh, given that the Lord Mayor has said publicly many times now that he wants to protect more green space in the city, that we will see some movement in the budget tomorrow on these issues. They are very important to the residents of my ward. These are very significant open space and bushland uh, issues in uh, Oxley and Corinda, and our community wants to see them preserved. And I know that Councillor uh, Griffith has spoken about this before uh, because he has attractive bushland on the other side of 17 Mile Rocks. And our objective here is to link these significant pieces of bushland together. Um, hopefully providing some really clever urban, uh, urban uh, design for uh, fauna movement across main roads so that it can be protected. So I know that Councillor Griffith shares my interest in ensuring that this bushland in Oxley is protected. 
Um, we want to see action on it. Um, I believe it is an important part of this portfolio, and certainly um, I'm calling on the Lord Mayor tomorrow um, to action those issues um, that I've raised in the Parks, Environment and Sustainability portfolio uh, to ensure that this significant bushland is protected. Further speakers? Councillor Hammond. Thank you, Mr Chairman, um, and um, thank you for giving the previous speaker so much grace on what she spoke about, um, especially with her... She doesn't actually understand that she's even doing it because it's so natural, her personal attacks and her threatening nature, which we're all becoming quite used to on this side of the chamber. I would like to clear the record on a couple of things that Councillor Johnson said. The Oxley Secondary School the state government aren't selling it to Councillor Johnson. They're not selling it. In fact, the previous Lord Mayor in July 2016 wrote to the then Minister of Infrastructure, Deputy, Tra Jack Sorry, Deputy Premier Jackie Trad. But they're not selling it. To the rear of the property. To the rear. No, because it's got too much commercial value, Councillor Johnson. They want to sell it off for development. Councillor Johnson, just uh, there is no asset sales with this government, is there? The state government? I mean, goodness me, we've already spoken about 818 Roadie Road that the state government sold off to a um, private developer when we offered millions of dollars, four million dollars for this site, Koala Habitat. They sold it off. Then this Labor state government approved 80 per cent of that Koala Habitat to be cleared, Mr Chair. They don't asset sale. Councillor Shree, you might be interested in this. They sold a whole unit complex, this Labor state government. You brought up asset sales over there. The whole unit complex of public housing in my ward. In my ward. I understand that they actually don't like public housing and they'd like to see more people hey, on the street. Hey, hey, hey. Councillors will be heard in silence. I'm just demonstrating the asset sales that this state Labor government are doing. Mr Chair, we don't, under the bushland, um, pres um, bushland acquisition, we don't force people to sell their properties to us. We make contact with people and, Mr Chair, due to the privacy legislation, it would be irresponsible of us to tell people who we're actually approaching. Absolutely irresponsible. So back to Oxley Creek, Councillor. I met. I offered to meet Councillor Johnson. I sent her an email when I first took over this chair from the capable hands of Councillor McLaughlin to meet with her about what she would like to see. I got a beautiful, beautiful, stunningly personally attacking email back saying no. Now, Councillor Johnson, to the rear of that property is land that's got bushland on it. We, and you yourself have stood up in this place and said that you could, that, you know, you know, it'd be great if the state government handed it over to us, but we don't know how much contamination or what's wrong with that site and how much it would do to remediate that land. You've admitted that in this place, Councillor Johnson. You know, she says that nothing's been spent in Tennyson Ward. Has she got to be kidding? She has had more spent money spent in Tennyson Ward over the last 10 years than any other ward. Point of order, Madam Chairman. Yeah, point of order to you, Councillor Johnston. Yeah, claim to be misrepresented. Noted, Councillor. I Hammond. note those people laugh over there, but when the flooding happened across this city, Councillor Johnston's ward received more money across this city than anybody Councils else, and you don't hear anybody from this side of the chamber whinging and whining about it. I want to clear the record again. This Councilor, administration— Councillor Johnston, if you do not cease interjecting, I will name you. Councilor we didn't Hammond. complain over here, Councillor Johnston, nor did my residents when the money was transferred to you. I would like to make clear the record. Over 700 hectares of bushland over the last three years has been preserved under this Lord Mayor and the previous Lord Mayor and those on this side of the chamber. We will receive very, very shortly—we will meet our target 
of over 750 hectares of bushland preserved in three years. This I am very proud of. But again, when we are out there talking, recommendations come in all over the place. Um, Councillor Marks came up with some the other day. Um, Councillor Adams. Notice the other side haven't done anything Councilors except for Councillor Johnson. In silence. Councillor Hammond. Except for Councillor Johnson giving me bushland that she would like to have a look at. Our officers go and investigate that. We do not compulsory um, force people to buy. Um, sell their land to us, but we do talk to people. It would be irresponsible, again I repeat, irresponsible for us to publish who we're actually speaking to across this city. Thank you. And I'll put the resolution. Oh, there's a, the misrepresentation. Please stick to the misrepresentation alone, Councillor Johnston. Yes. Um, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Hammond um, stated that I'd been given more money than anybody ever in the ward. Um, my point in my speech that she misrepresented was about um, bushland and recreational space protection and buyback, and that there had been none in Tennyson Ward. Right. I now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Field services, please. Councillor Howard. Thank you, Chair. I move that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Howard, seconded by Councillor Marks, that the report of the Field Services Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Howard? Any further speakers? There being none, I'll put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, the Council is the Community Art and Lifestyle Committee. Councillor Maddock. Uh, Mr Chair, I move the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Maddock, seconded by Councillor Cunningham, that the report of the Community Arts and Lifestyle Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Councillor Maddock. Any other speeches? Any other speakers? Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, Mr Chairman. Um, I rise to speak on the City Hall concerts. Um, one of the best things that we do in Council is to provide um, free weekly concerts for uh, Brisbane ratepayers um, through from February to November. Um, in fact, my office is immediately behind the organ, as Councillor Shree would now know, and uh, whenever there is a concert on, um, I can certainly very clearly hear uh, what's happening, uh, and certainly there are of um, you know, wonderful flavour every week, um, slightly different music every week, uh, and they're just wonderful to listen and enjoy. I, um, I just wanted to say that I know uh, in talking to seniors in my area that they love coming into town to see them, uh, that this is a fantastic um, program uh, that we should always continue. Uh, there are certainly, um, I know, some demands at the end of the year with the seniors, Christmas parties and things like that, um, but I'd certainly suggest that we look at another day, perhaps, and certainly look at doing them in um, January as well. Um, older people don't work on the same sort of school uh, routine that we do, and I think that um, this is an area where we have clearly a lot of um, people who are attending City Hall. It, it activates the space really fantastically, um, and I believe that we should continue what we're doing. Um, I mean, it says here in paragraph four, which is quite extraordinary, the concerts attract an average of 800 people a week. 800 people a week come to City Hall on a Tuesday for the free concert. Um, that's obviously a raging success. It is obviously something that we should continue to build on, uh, and I think that we should um, certainly look at adding additional days in January and perhaps some other days of the week uh, so that we can continue to offer this wonderful service. Um, for example, I would think that you know, we should have a Mums and Bubs concert maybe um, on one of the days so mums can bring their um, toddlers and babies in and listen to music. I think that would be a fantastic idea. Um, so they don't have to be just uh, obviously for seniors, um, but they could be for uh, you know, they could be for other um, uh, groups in the community as well. Um, so, look, this is an excellent service. Um, we need to continue it, and I think we should be looking at new and innovative ways to add to um, the offering that we have here, uh, given it is so well supported. Further speakers? Councillor Matic. 
I'll now put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, Council is the Finance and Administration Committee. Councillor Allen. Mr Chair, I move that the report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting held on Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Seconded. Been moved by Councillor Allen, seconded by Councillor McLaughlin. The report of the Finance and Administration Committee meeting dated Tuesday, the 4th of June 2019, be adopted. Is there any debate, Councillor Allen? Any other speakers? There being none, I will put the resolution. All those in favour say aye. Aye. And the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Councillors, are there any petitions? Councillor Howard. Uh, yes, I have a petition regarding end of trip facilities in Fortitude Valley. Anyone else? May I, have a, may I have a motion to receive the petitions? Uh, Mr Chair, I move that petitions as presented be received and referred to the committee concerned for consideration and report. Seconded. It's been moved by Councillor Richards, seconded by Councillor Griffiths, that all petitions as presented be received and referred to the, to the Committee Concerned for Consideration and Report. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Uh, councillors, are there any statements required as a result of a councillor conduct review panel order? Are there any matters of general business? Councillor Cumming. Thank you, Mr Chair. Mr Chair, in relation to uh, the ENC report earlier today, Lord Mayor claimed that I'd said that uh, rate increases should be in line with increases received by council workers. Uh, I can't recall ever saying that. But I'll say, say that uh, my recollection is what I did say was executive salary increases should be in line with the inflation rate, which is quite a different proposition. The other uh, matter I wish to speak about is um, an approach I've had from a, uh, a resident uh, of Clayfield, Mr Cameron Russell. Uh, Mr Russell heads the Clayfield Flood Affected Residents Group. His concerns relate to the failure of flood mitigation works being undertaken in respect of uh, flood mitigation scope of works relating to airport link. Uh, flooding in the area where he lives has worsened. Council's flood wise reports indicate increases of up at least one metre in uh, flooding in any particular rainfall event. The air airport link project was required to ensure that the project design had no adverse impact on existing properties in the area during a one in 100 year average recurrence interval flood event. Mr Russell believes that the flood mitigation work that should have been done was contractually required and paid for has not been done. I toured the site and observed that there was no evidence of any excavation having been carried out on the northern side of Schultz Canal from underneath Sandgate Road bridge towards Widdop Street. The cycle and pedestrian path I walked on under the Sandgate Road bridge extended some 200 metres to the car park bridge, but according to the uh, requirements of the uh, of the, of the uh, development application, it should have been excavated. I walked over the Toomble Shopping Centre bridge. The bridge should not be there, as the scope of works require the removal of this bridge. I noted further that there was a cycle and pedestrian path on the southern side of Schultz Canal, allowing access to Whittop Street. The entire area was to have been excavated. There was no evidence of excavation having taken place. Specifically, excavation was required to be undertaken under the Sandgate Road Bridge to a level of uh, 0.4 metre AHD on the northern banks. Excavation downstream of Sandgate Road and upstream of Woodham Street uh, by approximately 30 metre wide up to 1.6 metre AHD on the southern bank and 21 metres to 1.6 metre AHD on the northern bank. Works had not been carried out and Brisbane City Council has not received certification that the works are completed, specifically in relation to condition 10 of development approval a 0031954A3 issued on 30th of January 2012. Mr Russell believes the Brisbane City Council is at fault in not demanding that the work be done. Essentially, significant volumes of earth should have been excavated various parts of the project area, uh, project site area, but this has not been done. Uh, Mr uh, Russell points to a report in 2010, uh, T. John Holland commissioned a report by Parson Brinkhoff Arup, who had been engaged by TGHs as their airport link engineering consultants to undertake a new flood mitigation study. The flood report showed the flooding of 45 Millman Street Clayfield, which is Mr Russell's house, and surrounding properties, uh, one of which 17 Kemble Street Clayfield was purchased by council in 2015 under the voluntary home purchase scheme. 
This study, while not as in-depth as previous studies, includes a statement of note is that some significant excavation works along Schultz Canal between Sandgate Road and Headley Drain are already necessary to comp compensate for the east-west arterial widening in the floodplain. My tour indicated these excavation works have not been done. Mr Russell also provided details of works not done under the initial development approvals on, on the, or the third development approval. So there's a development approval A00214643, 17th of December 2008. Uh, prescribed title works not done includes construction of a boardwalk under North Coast Railway Line. Flood mitigation works not done includes widening and deepening Schultz Canal with volume of excavation to be approximately 30,000 cubic metres. Removal of Toomball Shopping Centre Car Park Ridge. Development approval A002276647 49, 14th of May 2009. Work not done includes widening works along Schultz Canal over 900 metres in length, approximately 17,000 cubic metres of excavation. Mr. Russell also provides details of works not done under the current development approval, which was uh, A00319548330, 30th of January 2012. Work not done there was excavation under Sandgate Road to a level of 0.4 metre AHD in the northern bank, excavation downstream of Sandgate Road and upstream of Widdop Street by approximately 30 metres wide to 1.6 metres AHD on the southern bank and 21 metres up to 1.6 metre AHD on the northern bank. Removal of the, uh, as I said earlier, the Toomball Shopping Centre car park bridge and excavation downstream of Widdop Street, a bridge by approximately 26 metres wide to 1.6 AHD on the southern bank. Now, Mr Russell wants Council to force the State Government as owner of Airport Link to complete the works. The State Government has powers to force the works to be done in whole. Uh, if all works cannot be done, then property sh should be purchased on a compulsory basis to save people, save people from being flooded. If all the works uh, were done, Mr. B Mr Russell believes the flooding problem would be vastly reduced. In the event that Council refuses to force the State Government to do the job, Mr Russell will take the matter in further and complain to the relevant authority. Mr Russell is not happy with the response he has received from his local councillor, the councillor of Hamilton Ward, councillor David McLaughlin. Uh, Mr Russell complains councillor McLaughlin has acted in a manner which, that protects council from criticism rather than forcing the developer to comply with the conditions of what was, after all, one of Brisbane's largest ever infrastructure projects. Uh, now, further speeches. Councillors, you'll note that this is a maiden speech or a first speech, and, and it's courtesy here that the the councillor will be heard in silence. Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mr Chair. In 1907, George Bernard Shaw wrote, I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community as long as I live. It is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die, for the harder I work, the more I live. I feel enormously grateful to stand in this beautiful chamber delivering my first speech as the councillor for McDowell Ward. Being elected or appointed to public office is a great honour. To have the opportunity to serve in a community where you live and that you love is an immense privilege. To have that opportunity at two levels of government is truly humbling. In May 2009, I gave my first speech to the Queensland Parliament. Each year, I would reread that speech to make sure that the intent of the promise that I gave the community was not lost or forgotten because at the core of that speech was the promise to work hard, value, listen and to act for locals for a better future. It is a sentiment that holds true today and it is a commitment that I give McDowell Ward residents as their new local councillor. Just as Shaw wrote, it is my privilege to do for my community whatever I can. I'd like to take a moment to pay tribute to my predecessor and friend Norm Wyndham. Norm was a passionate advocate for the McDowell Ward community for over 15 years. His vision for the community was clear and simple, and that was to make our part of Brisbane an even better place to live, work, play and raise a family. He delivered major infrastructure projects for our area. He gave us a network of footpaths and bike paths, and there were many park upgrades. He was, and still is, dedicated to the preservation of green space and our bushland areas and encouraging our young people to care for our local natural environment. Norm was also known as the fire ant man. There wasn't much Norm didn't know about fire ants. And as I make my way around the community, 
it is very clear that I have big shoes to fill. Everyone knows Norm. His legacy is not only what he has delivered, but that he cared deeply about our community and cared deeply about the people who live here. I wish him and his lovely wife, Patsy, all the best in retirement and the new adventures that that brings. Mr Chair, like Norm, I have an unashamed passion for our community. My husband, John, and I have lived in the McDowell Ward for over 20 years. It's where we raised our family, and so it is no surprise to us why people want to call this area home. Because we have a terrific neighbourhood, bushland, picnic areas, walking tracks and open space. It's a local community that connects people by drawing them to common spaces, happier for that shared community. And I think that this is because having a sense of community can greatly benefit families and businesses in a variety of ways. By connecting people, helping them reach their goals and making them feel safe and secure is what turns our suburbs into communities and our houses into homes. We are so fortunate to have the beautiful Chermside Hills Reserves on our doorstep. The reserves link through to the Cabbage Tree Creek and Little Cabbage Tree Creek corridors, which are popular with walkers and runners. Of course, on the weekend, families are out for a barbecue or simply to enjoy the green space and the wildlife. One of the joys of living near these corridors is coming home to find a swamp wallaby grazing in your front yard or hopping across the street near your house. It reminds us too that sometimes we are fortunate to preserve these bushlands through accidents of history. Whilst much of the flat land in the area was taken up for farming and the creeks taken up for local industry, the Chermside Hills were considered pretty scratchy terrain and as such they were left alone by settlers. This was fortuitous for us, for we now recognise how important these green hearts are to the livability of our city and its suburbs. Sadly, not everyone recognises that these are opportunities that can be too precious to simply ignore. It's a travesty that the state Labor government sold significant bushland in Remick Street uh, for redevelopment. This beautiful parcel of land directly abuts the existing Chermside Hill reserves. I'm proud to join a council team that is genuinely committed to acquiring land that extends our precious bushland reserves and to champion the biggest investment in parks and green space that the city has ever seen. And McDowell Ward is home to many beautiful parks, like Taralba Park in the southwestern corner of the ward, which is a great space for families to enjoy. And the park also boasts 12 sporting playing fields. Taralba means tall trees, and it was an important meeting place and key trade corridor for Aboriginal people. A commemorative Sorry Day plaque was installed by Council in the park as a mark of respect, apology and remembrance for the stolen generations. From the mid to late 1800s, part of the park area was a very successful vineyard, and over the next 40 years the area was occupied by very successful Chinese market gardeners. There's also an historical mosaic depicting an infamous 1936 fire whereby locals formed a human chain of water buckets in order to save nearby houses. So it's a contemporary park with a very rich history. But there are challenges for our area. Development within our suburbs under the state government's requirement to infill our city with 156,000 more dwellings does impact and a balance needs to be reached. One of my priorities is to ensure that adequate planning occurs, particularly in Bridgman Downs on the edge of the city boundary. It is interesting, however, to see how some themes of local government and city development seem to survive the ages. In the Davis family, the history of William Pettigrew, my husband John's great-great-grandfather, was the story of a person with a very strong interest in Brisbane. William was a sawmiller who served for 15 years as an alderman on the Brisbane Municipal Council in three terms between 1863 and 1885, including a brief time as mayor in 1870. This crossed over with service in the Queensland Legislative Council between 1877 and 1894. In fact, William Pettigrew was one of the original petitioners for the formation of the municipality of Brisbane and later was one of those present when the foundation stone of the Brisbane Town Hall was laid in 1864. But it was his advocacies that draw the parallel with our modern city. William was renowned for his passion for forest conservation 
and this aligns with this administration's continued purchase, purchase of bushland, uh, along with increasing the number of parks, more tree plantings, and with the goal of being the koala capital. William supported the building of a bridge over the river, and our Lord Mayor, of course, has announced his plan to build five new green bridges on, over the Brisbane River to build a cleaner, greener and more active city. And one of William Pettigrew's key legacies also resonates with our Council's work on preserving heritage character. It was noted that his true legacy was in his pioneering production of high quality, inexpensive construction timber to, to create Australia's most distinctive and functional architectural form, the Queenslander. William Pettigrew's own house in William Street was initially preserved as a heritage building but sadly was demolished in 1970 to make way for the Alice Street on-ramp. So the challenge to preserve our rich history is something that touches us all. And lastly, there are legacies which show the hazards of our river city. Williams Mill was destroyed in the 1893 floods, which started the demise of his businesses. We all love our river and we love our city, but we also know that we need to live with and manage its dangers. Whilst we are the river city, we are also a big city, and we need to ensure that we have thriving centres of interest in our local suburbs. I said earlier what turns our suburbs into communities and our houses into homes is drawing people out onto common spaces, making people connected in a physical space, happy for that shared community. And in that context, I'm delighted with the progress of the Aspley Village Precinct project greening the heart of Aspley Shopping Centre and making it a more connected and pedestrian-friendly space. Barren concrete pathways are being softened with plantings and shop facades are being revitalised, and people are already noticing just how good the improvements are. Mr Chair, the Lord Mayor has made clear that his vision is to make the Brisbane of tomorrow even better than the Brisbane of today. In his first speech as Lord Mayor, he spoke about the pillars of his exciting agenda of building and protecting, building the infrastructure that our city needs as it grows, not only the bridges and better public transport, but building a stronger, united, tolerant community. As a former small business owner, I'm particularly excited about his vision to make Brisbane Australia's most small business friendly city. And the second pillar, second pillar is to protect what is great about our city the lifestyle, the suburbs, the green space, protecting our wildlife, our koala corridors, and the character that is quintessential Brisbane. The McDowell Ward is a great part of Brisbane. Its local natural beauty and its vibrant community spirit gives it a beautiful heart. Its residents and its community groups make it live and breathe. I'm so proud to know so many of those wonderful people, and I look forward to meeting many more. Mr Chair, I am excited to be part of a team that will deliver such a bold vision for the future of this city. And I hope that in my time as the councillor for McDowell Ward, I too can make our part of Brisbane even better. Yeah. Congratulations. <clears throat> Congratulations, Councillor Davis. Welcome. Further speakers, Councillor Johnston. Uh, yes, I rise to uh, speak briefly on a couple of matters. Um, firstly, uh, Councillor Hammond's uh, comments about me not wanting to meet with her, and uh, secondly, um, village precinct projects. Um, I'm just going to read into the record uh, what occurred, and I note Councillor Hammond fleeing out the door, and I can understand why. Um, uh, her personal assistant uh, contacted me by email and said the following. Dear Councillor Johnston, Councillor Hammond would like to extend an invitation to meet with you in her role as the Chair of the Environment, Parks and Sustainability Committee to discuss any issues that you may have in your ward. As you can understand, Councillor Hammond is extremely busy at this point. However, she would like to suggest the meeting be held in your office, i.e. my office, in City Hall at 11.10am on the 30th of April for approximately half an hour. Please advise if this date and time is acceptable. So I did reply to um, Councillor Hammond's uh, 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 PA, and I'd, I'd just like to put my reply on the record uh, as well, because I, I felt it was um, it was a reasonably sort of conciliatory, um, you know, response to what was a very sort of specific uh, request, um, and 
you know, I, I, I did raise a couple of issues um, with respect to it, uh, but I, I just, oh my God, I've got two seconds. I can see the email, but I cannot see the reply. Anthony Shorten. Um, Councillor Johnson, yep. do, are you prepared? Yes, yes, I am, and I'm more than happy to continue. I'm just pulling this up, uh, and uh, I would just like to put on the record uh, my response uh, to Councillor Hammond, um, because Councillor Hammond might have led, left people with the impression that somehow I was rude to her, and I wouldn't want that to be the, her intention. Uh, dear PA, thank you for your email. Please advise Councillor King, and I apologise, I did refer to her as Councillor King. Um, I look forward to working with her in a new role and with member, other members of the Parks, Environment and Sustainability Committee, as I've been doing for many years. In her capacity as the new chairman of Parks, Environment and Sustainability Committee, I ask that Councillor King urgently progresses the park naming of Ron Goldner Park and Rigby Park a place in Yoronga. That council is continuing to allow six non-local people to hold up such an important local initiative, particularly when council's policy is to recognise World War I service, generally is appalling. By the time council returns on 7 May, it will be two months since my support was put on in writing to council with no action taken uh, by asset services to progress the park naming. The petitions have been done and considered by council months ago. Naming information and historical information uh, uh, has been provided. I've indicated my support to the manager of asset services attached and for those distinguished veterans and community volunteers. And yet the park naming submissions have not progressed. There is no reason for this ongoing delay. Uh, Council's delay on this matter reflects poorly on the handling uh, of the matter. Uh, of, the, of this progress uh, and the community's wishes, particularly in light of the service records of the Rigby family and Mr Goldner, in addition to his 30 years of community service, um, uh, in addition to his uh, 30 years of community service, was a national serviceman. The petition of the park naming should be progressed as a matter of urgency. I urge Councillor King to ensure that this happens at the first committee meeting back in May. I will not be meeting one-on-one -on -one with Councillor King, and again I apologise Councillor Hammond, as it is now. Her offensive statements about me, both in the council chamber and to the media, have been unnecessary and defamatory. In particular, her comments in, council, uh, in the council chamber last August, when I was not present, that I was preventing her from seeing her children were just vile and beneath her. I asked for an apology then and got no response, so it's much too late now. So that's what I actually sent to Councillor King, um, indicating that I was happy to work with her and there was a priority issue. Um, but what I will not put up with is being accused um, by a councillor in this place of preventing someone from seeing their children, um, because that was truly um, an awful evening. Point of order, Mr Chair. Point of order, Councillor Richards. Uh, could you please ask the councillor for Tennyson to actually speak into the microphone so we can hear it clearly, please? Um, uh, um, please be mindful of microphone use in the future, Councillor Johnston, but I heard you fine. Yes, well, um, that's, that's, I've, I've seen it back on TV. I'm not shouting like I'm often accused of. People can hear me quite clearly. Councillor so, Johnston, please, look, you know. look, it's a general business item. Yep. Um, to, to, to just to, to talk like this, can, can you please talk about the subject at hand, which is whether you want to talk to Councillor Hammond or not about parks in your area, um, not rehash old personal disputes, nor, um, nor review um, and, and attempt to renew old personal disputes. That's that's not what this is about. Can you please just um, what, just keep to the subject matter that you said at the start, please? Uh, that is what I said I would be speaking about um, the meeting with Councillor Hammond, and also um, uh, some planning issues. Um, around the village precincts projects. So I am speaking to what I stood up to speak about. And if we're having a problem with hearing me, I'm happy to raise my voice, but then I'm accused of shouting. So, you know, um, Mr Chairman, if you feel there's a problem with the microphone, I'd appreciate hearing from you. I, I don't have any Excellent. issue. I, I well, said that's that to good you, to know. I said that to you before, but, well, but please, can we keep it professional, um, is what I'm well, saying. I've read an email. 
I'm sorry. And I'm saying, and I think it is appropriate to say, um, that we are elected to come into this place and debate issues. Um, I found it appalling, and I still do, um, that Councillor Hammond stood up while I was not here at council um, claiming that I was preventing her from seeing her children. It's a matter of public um, record I that that is what she said. We, and we, are, we are here to debate issues, not personalities. And, and that's what I've been saying. These matters are not relevant to the council. Please return to the subject matter that's relevant to the professional conduct of this council. And that is the actions of Councillor Hammond, as I outlined in my general business item before us today. So if I'm breaching a rule of procedure, please let me know, Mr Chairman, but otherwise I'm speaking to the issues that I said I would speak to, which as I understand is my obligation under the meeting's local law. So let me be clear. I'm not stopping anybody from seeing their children. Point of order. Councillor Hammond, point of order. I'm sorry, I've had enough now. She is personally attacking me. Okay. She's bringing my children into it when I never said what she was claiming. It's quite clearly on the record that those okay. other people this in this chamber. Point of is I am sit sick down. of Councillor this Hammond, personal please attack. Sit. Councillor Hammond, please sit down. As I've said multiple times tonight, personal disputes are not a matter of this council. All right? They are not a matter of business here. If you have a personal dispute, there are other ways to deal with it, but it's not, this is not the forum for them. All right? Council Johnston. Thank you. Um, now, um, I'll take the interjection from Councillor Hammond. Um, did, what did I just say about not relitigating personal matters in this place? Please stick to the business at hand. Which is, Mr. Chairman, um, my interaction with Councillor King, which I am detail, uh, Councillor Hammond, which I'm detailing on the record, and I would like to get on the record. Um, I don't have a problem with it. She stood up earlier in this meeting, Mr. Chairman, and said that somehow I'd been rude to her with respect to attending a meeting. Now, in general business, it is my opportunity to reply. I've stood up and I've said what I'd like to speak on, and I intend to speak to it. And again, if you feel I'm breaching a rule of procedure, please tell me, but it's not my understanding that you can direct what I say. Now, to be clear, I was certainly happy to discuss with Councillor Hammond any issues of portfolio matters in the committee of which we are both a member. However, I will not be meeting with her one-on-one -on -one until she apologises for her actions in the council chamber last year. They were appalling. I was not present when she made these allegations, and I've never had the opportunity to respond to them. Uh, I do not feel it is appropriate for anybody to claim that someone is stopping them from seeing their children, um, and I want to put on the record my concern about what she said and the reason for which I chose not to meet with her one-on-one. -on, -one. on the second matter, village precinct projects, uh, can I say that um, the debate before us earlier today was about um, a particular petition, um, but it's a little bit of um, double dealing, I think, from Councillor Burke to stand up and say uh, that uh, there's been this great process of fairness about assessing the village precincts. Um, uh, last year in the budget, the village precincts were announced and the LNP administration picked some winners. And those winners all happen to be, except for one, um, in LNP wards. And it's very clear to me that no one was consulted. Councillors weren't asked to nominate projects. They weren't assessed against any independent criteria or benchmark. Um, they weren't taken off the existing skip list where many of us have had projects waiting for such a long time. Instead, um, this administration changed the name of the skip projects to village precincts and then decided to pick projects without any discussion or consultation with councillors. Now, I can understand Councillor Cook's concern 
uh, uh, with respect to how this matter has been dealt with, because like me, for the past 10 years, I've been advocating for two areas in my ward. Councillor Annalee... Johnston, your time has expired. Are there any further speakers? Councillor Maddock. Uh, Mr Chair, thank you. I'm conscious of the time and I'll be quick, but I just wanted to speak on the passing of uh, a very dear friend and resident and party stalwart within uh, local western suburbs of Ray Heron. I found out today of his passing on Saturday and I thought it was important to note uh, Ray's contribution to our local community, to the business community of Brisbane, as he was a significant uh, wholesaler and uh, worker within the wine industry. He uh, was involved in that industry for a number of years and had many significant connections uh, to the community and to the industry as a whole. But I really wanted to really speak briefly on, on Ray as a great party stalwart and a great human being. He uh, was full of life and so passionate. He was committed to the party, he was committed to his community. He was never backwards in voicing his opinion. Uh, when he thought you were right and he valued you, he loved you. And uh, when he didn't, uh, he didn't give you a lot of time a day. He was one of those amazing people that was so generous of spirit. Uh, and my heart really goes out to his wife, Geraldine, and to their family on this significant loss. He was a great contribution uh, to, to anywhere and, and everyone he went to. He was, uh, Mr Chair, um, a great father. He was a great husband. He was a great human being uh, and he will be missed. And I will miss his friendship and his kindness. And when he used to ring up and say he was coming up to Brisbane because he he, they moved to Northern New South Wales to be closer to the family, uh, I always look forward to his visit. I always used to call him the councillor for Paddington. And I always used to tell him that down in his local regional area, he should have run. Uh, he would have been a great local politician. So, Mr Chair, on that note, uh, Ray, uh, rest in peace and to the family, our deepest condolences from our team. Thank you. Further speakers, Councillor Richards. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Look, I just I realise the time and I just want to speak briefly about the Queensland Community Achievement Awards. Uh, Thursday the 9th of May was the launch that occurred this year um, in uh, Toowoomba's City Hall, whereby as the local councillor for the Pullenvale Ward, I am proud to be a sponsor of the Queensland Community Achievement Awards for the Pullenvale Ward Outstanding Achievement Award. Uh, as we all know, Pullenvale Ward is a diverse and unique blend of rural, residential and bushland areas with widespread countrysides and much more. It truly is where city living meets country lifestyle. Now, being within the 5 to 20 kilometre radius of the CBD of Brisbane, the diversity of landscape to the resilience of community members is captivating and certainly awe-inspiring. This area of the city has experienced severe weather extremes from flooding, isolation to impacts of lack of water, agricultural and acreage needs. Yet it is their resilience in the tough times, the community spirit, the extraordinary vol volunteerism of giving back yet paying it forward to future generations that is so unique to this country ward that is located in the capital city of Queensland. Where else in Australia can you live somewhere that is so unique to being close to city lifestyle yet country living? It's nowhere but the Pullenvale Ward here in Brisbane. That's why the Pullenvale Ward Outstanding Achievement is, is looking to recognise volunteers, innovative thinkers, high achievers and leaders living in and working in the Pullenvale Ward. It will pay tribute to the nominees' achievements and contribution to the community, welcoming nominations for individual residents, business owners or community and not-for-profit organisations based in the Pullenvale Ward. The award will also acknowledge excellence and leadership in their chosen profession or their field of endeavour. Great prizes are up for grab, with each category winner receiving $2,500 from the Commonwealth Bank. So nominations close on Wednesday, the 7th of August 2019. To submit a nomination, simply go to www.awardsaustralia.com, select Queensland Community Achievement Awards, and then nominate now. Thank you, Mr Chair. Further speakers? There being none, I declare the meeting closed. Thank you. See you all tomorrow. Put a pen for me there.